What's the word? Hello, Rain. everybody. <laughs> Welcome hey. to the Pros. Be doggies. I am your host, Jay Zombie, and I am here with Andy Dave. How are you doing, sir? I am doing awesome. Fantastic. And I also have Brian Criscal. How are you? Maintaining, man. Maintaining. <laughs> Sometimes that's all we can do. Yeah, man. Um, we might have a few more people join us as we as we go on, but you know, it is oh. Mother's Day. We we expect people to be spending time with their mothers and the mother of their children and all that fun stuff. But um without a mother, all of our appearances here would be plot holes. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. Damn. Absolutely. So um, what we are going to talk about today in episode two, I'm so excited that episode one was a huge hit. So episode two, we decided we were going to cover plot holes, uh, something that every writer is terrified of, something that everybody dreads and worries they're doing. Um, probably the biggest deterrent for me writing because I'm a wimp. And I don't want to write myself into a corner. <laughs> so I just don't write because then you can't be written into a corner, right? Um, which is which is terrible. And so one of the first things that I wanted to kind of talk with both of you guys about is what are your biggest like plot hole pet peeves? What are the ones that just like irk the shit out of you? Not following the rules that they set down or not setting down rules. Oh, dude, yes. That's why, like, it's the difference, uh, the example I give, it's the difference between original Ghostbusters and the 2016. <laughs> the original one, they had rules about how the technology worked and all that stuff. They're very specific. Yep. You catch the ghost, you put it away. That's what we did. That's what they did. And, the, and in the new Ghostbusters, they got things that throw ghosts around, cut ghosts in half, they explode ghosts. They, they, I mean, it, they, there was no sticking to any rules whatsoever. And other than the fact that it just wasn't funny, plot-wise, it takes you right out. It's like, well, if there's no rules, what you know, what am I paying attention to? Right. And and you know, one of the so I'm and I'll be the first to admit, <laughs> I'm a terrible writer because I don't read a lot. Um, and and I don't mean terrible as in I'm not good at writing. I mean terrible as in that's like a sin of a writer is not to read. <laughs> um, it is. but I I'm one of those people I do better with like audiobooks and stuff like that typically. Oh, that's um, that's that's the same. That counts. Yeah, but the as a result there's a lot of there's a lot of books that aren't on audio that are notorious for plot holes and I wish I could recall the name but I know uh, a friend of mine who has a, an author that he reads who is like the worst at plot holes. He will he'll have an entire crew. They'll be going through this dungeon this whole time back up against a wall all the baddies are coming and magically one of the guys remembers that he has this random bracelet that can transport them out and that's what happens and so he pops this Machina. bracelet that never happened that was never explained yeah. it transports them out of the out of the everything and now they're just safe and you just move on and it's that's like no planning whatsoever for it was terrible. It, it was every what, what is book. This? I can't remember. I'll, I'll if I remember it, okay. I'll uh, I'll tweet about it uh, when I retweet this out because I can't. I cannot remember the author, but he did it in almost every single book he wrote, and it was just like you'd be getting into. It, you're like, man, how are they going to get out of it? And he'd be like, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know. Magic bracelet. And you're like, what the? Yeah. What the fuck? It's no, the, you can't just do that. <laughs> it's the Deus. It's what I would call the Deus Ex Machina plot hole. Yeah, and it's, it, uh, it's exactly that. It's just like the writer has written themselves into a corner. And so they're just like, oh, uh, I'm just going to magically wish them out of this predicament. Yeah, it's just it's it's just it's lazy. It's poor writing. That's, and it's it's incredibly like, frustrating as the reader. Um, it's a big womp, 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 womp. Exactly. Oh, OK, you don't want your you do not want your reader to feel let down. You yes. There's so many things that you don't want happening, and the worst thing you could do is to promise and to not deliver. So that actually leads into my biggest pet with plot holes is when you have a character who has done all of this growth and all of this journey, and they've become this like this new epic character, and you realize that you can't go anywhere with that now, and so you take it all back. Oh, it's like I just oh, sat with you. That woman. Yeah. 
It's a like, bad I just TV sat show. with me Red for Red hours. <laughs> That's Go an ahead, Dave. Sin. Yeah, the Batwoman TV show retcons like every episode that way. That it, oh. It's like she learns this new lesson, and then in the next in the next episode, nope, it's all gone away. It's so it's just so frustrating because it's like I I understand as somebody who has a shit memory who has a very hard time uh, keeping track of everything. It is really difficult to make sure that you're keeping up on everything that you've had your characters go through. But that's why, just like we said in the first one, um, Adam, Adam AF brought it up. That's why you have a Bible. That's why you create that for yeah. your character. So you mm -hmm. can't take it back from them because it's now canon. It's part of them. But of course we have this thing in comic books that's known as the retcon. <laughs> and the, like the worst offender that I could think of off the top of my head like that was in uh was in Spider-Man when uh, Mephisto like basically undid Peter Parker and Mary Jane's um uh, marriage. marriage. Right? Mm -hmm. And I understood why they kind of did that because they were like, well, Peter Parker is supposed to be a loser, right? And mm -hmm. so they wanted to make him like the loser Peter Parker again. Well, the way you do that is then like make get you know just have them get divorced for real, yeah. have, have the relationship fail because you know I've never been married so I've never been divorced. But everybody I know who's been divorced will tell you that you feel like a loser, like the world's biggest loser when that happens. And so like why not do that? But instead, you know, once again, it, you know, it's like using the uh, the. Uh, a deus ex machina yeah it's terrible i, uh, I can't stand that uh, I, for papa kino i don't i just watched the uh i just watched the thorius unlimited <laughs> videos on batwoman <laughs> so i grew it from him <laughs> i haven't seen it i haven't seen it it's the cringe it's watch fun. watch watch i think it's thorius Th thorius unlimited thorius okay Look him up. He does a whole thing on Supergirl. His Batman, his Batwoman videos are just hilarious. He didn't hates it, that show so bad and has reviewed every single episode. This is <laughs> th this this might be bullshit, but did I hear that Rachel Maddow was in an episode of Batwoman? I don't know. I don't know. Or maybe somebody was just saying Why? that the, the woman that's playing Batwoman looks like Rachel Maddow. Maybe. But, but I think somebody said that there's an actual seat, like she's actually, or maybe Batwoman turns on the TV and it's like Rachel Maddow going, Russia, 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 Russia. And <laughs> Batwoman just kind of goes, oh, I can relax again. Oh. I don't know. But uh, Samir, I agree with you. I hate, I hate the fact that it's, it's such a stereotype that at no point in time can any superhero have any life. Um, I will say I, there are two that I, I feel like did it very well for me, at least. Um, and I'm probably going to get crucified by the chat, but I don't really give a shit. Uh, sure, sure. So my first one, <laughs> right. So just whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first one is the one that got me into comics, which was Flash Rebirth. And the thing that I loved about that is they they did something that's very tricky because they posed the idea of basically taking back all of the progress that had happened for Barry Allen because he had broken out of the Speed Force. Reverse Flash was why he broke out of the Speed Force. And then Reverse Flash was going back through time and basically trying to, to trap Barry in the Speed Force so he couldn't get back out. And the way he was right. going to do it was by killing Iris because that was his lightning rod. Right. So they they toyed with the idea of taking away everything that made Barry Barry. But the the kicker was they did it so well that it gave Barry an insane motive because he was so in love with Iris that he could not lose her. He right. refused to let her die, even yeah. if it meant that he was going to just not exist because that's how much he loved her. And then that turns into that's a happy family. Um and if a spoiler alert, he saves her and everything's great. Cool. And it becomes a joke to them, the little lightning rod that reverse flash used. So he did it really, really good. And then um, Aquaman in the new 52. So if anybody read Aquaman in the new 52, uh -huh. I fucking, I fucking love it. Okay. So you have Arthur. 
Arthur is the biggest dick in the world in the beginning of this thing. Like he's out and he's talking with these people in, in town and they're like, oh yeah, what's the goldfish over there saying? Har, har, har. And he's like, yeah, ha ha, funny. And then he, he, you know, is up on his like cliff house where he's just trying to be away from everybody. And uh, a whole bunch of like creatures from uh, Atlantis, not like they were fighting against Atlantis, start coming onto shore. And all these Atlanteans start coming onto shore because they've decided that everybody on the surface is what's wrong. And they all need to be eliminated. And so they come in and they start killing all of these people and fighting all of these people on the beach. And he's stand, standing there on the ledge and he's just like, well. And then you have Mira who comes up and she's like, really, Arthur? And he's like, what? They're dickheads. And she's like, get your fucking ass down there and go save them. Like, you know that you can. You're not going to, you are not this person. And he's like oh damn it you're right and so he goes down and he saves them all despite them all being assholes to him and those do but that like, that dynamic right with the two of them is is brilliant because that's exactly what it's like like when you're in a good relationship you you make each other better, even when the other person's like i don't feel like it and it's like no but you're gonna you're gonna be better yeah and so and that's it sounds only great. two times I've seen I would it. Read that. I, I would I would read that I would read that for sure. I would definitely read that. It was it was really, really good. Uh I didn't I didn't stick with it super long, so I don't know if it turned shit like a lot of DC storylines did in the new 52. But um I really, really liked that one. That was really entertaining for me. And I, I loved the fact that it was a happy marriage. It wasn't, you know, we don't have to drag everybody down and like granted you start delving into either of their like extended family and it starts to get a little hairy but at least they had something good right 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 i I always to me the the, uh my favorite comics power couple was always uh mr miracle and big barda (gasps) love love those two love that romance i a thousand percent need to do a, a big barda cosplay like yeah you do she's, she's me dude <laughs> oh god did you see did you see have you seen sjw big barda i no, i i can't i, I refuse i don't want to I'm, i know what they did to she hulk i refuse to see any other sjw well redone. well well it's it's if you just think about it like gee what would sjw big barda look like you know what they did like they a man her big barda oh gosh oh. Yeah, yeah. They you want to know why? She was like a glamazon. She was like a. I don't exist. That's ball. why. We don't exist. Dude. I'm I'm six foot one. I'm over two hundred pounds because I'm like a fucking. I'm Scandinavian. I'm huge. All yeah, right? I got I big old shoulders. Like I don't exist. Yeah, yeah. It's oh you know, <laughs> god. But also, it's just like, well, she can't be hot. You know, she's got to be, be yeah. not loud. Yeah, uh, not approved, not a, not approved, but not, not, approved. A, not approved body type. <laughs> not approved body. Exactly. There's only one body type that's allowed, except for She Hulk, uh, well, and she gets the male body type. It's a potato. Oh, it's disgusting. Potatoes are allowed. It's like you only- know who to like. Like to me, She Hulk should look like Frank. Like Frank Cho to me, it would be the perfect uh, She Hulk artist because he draws these fantasy women that are muscular. But they have mm-hmm. body fat. Do you know? Yes. What I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they still look sort of soft, and it's just like, yeah, well, okay, maybe that's not a realistic body type. But we're talking about fucking comic books. We're talking about heroes. We're talking right. about fantasy. You know? Oh God! But uh, it's you know it's this it's this it's this aspiration for realism in comic that I just do not understand. Well, it's not even realism. It isn't even realism. It is a like a caricature of unhealthy and unlike things that people could attain obtain if they like didn't do anything and didn't ever have to better themselves and didn't ever try. Like they're just awesome. It's just it's disgusting. Like right. I had a I had a friend who showed me like Shiri number one. Right, this is long after I I stopped reading Mar- Marvel comics, but it was Shiri number one, and you see Shiri, you know, from Black Panther, flying through the air, and and, and she's saying, "I'm awesome," and I thought 
that right there, that one panel, it's going to sum up this entire decade of, of comic book writing. How are you going to know she's awesome if she doesn't say it? Exactly. I mean, it's, we, not, a, it's not like the look at. I don't know. Uh, action is character, right? <laughs> action is character. Maybe we could just have her watch her do something awesome, but no. We have to know that she's a complete character. She doesn't need to grow. She's well, perfect. She's fine just the way she is. And that's the case with all of the JLP heroes. When it that kind of shit, the thing that really bothers me is they they say these things as if it is like it's fact, as opposed to like <laughs> circumstantial. Like it's it's not what is considered awesome is not the same across the board. And so if you want to show me that you're awesome and you want me to feel like you're awesome, then do something that's fucking awesome. And then maybe I will agree. But if you're going to sit here and be like, well, I'm awesome. And be like, well, usually people that have to say it pretty much sucks. So it's kind of like when you're like, yeah, yeah. I'm really, I'm really popular. And it's like, no, you're not. Cause you wouldn't have to works. say it. <laughs> exactly. And then only that, that kind of an attitude only works if you have a character like Namor, right. Who is Awesome, but is also a complete and utter tool. Right, mm -hmm. dick. But you, but uh, you know, you can't take your eyes off him. You yeah. know, he's still an exciting, exciting, interesting, uh, a colorful character. Yeah. Uh, when you know, uh, back to the to the subject of plot holes. My big bugaboo, like the plot, the type of plot hole that really just burns my britches is the logical plot hole. The worst defender I could possibly think of is Signs, the M. Night Shyamalan movie. <laughs> you know, the one with, uh, um, who's that? Joaquin Phoenix and Mel Gibson. Yeah. Right? I, and, I think I know exactly where you're going you with know where I'm. You know where I'm going with yeah. this. If you've seen, that, <laughs> you've seen that piece of shit, you know exactly where I'm going. <laughs> not a, really not a bad movie. Overall, until you get to the ending. Now, Shay, have you have you seen this? Uh, yes, many, 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 okay. many times. In okay. fact, I I used it as an to why it was okay that I would leave drinks halfway around the house, and I was like, but if aliens come, we're good. Okay. So, <laughs> all right, all right. So you're the author. You know that the world is being invaded by a uh, a uh, a space faring race this is a race that obviously probably doesn't come from our own solar system which means they probably have like some pretty tricked out gear like faster than light drives right yeah. or something that allows them to uh, um, fold space right like the guild steersmen do in dune right Either way, they have some really advanced technology that manages to get them from some remote part of some remote galaxy right into our backyard. And so they're going to invade our planet. And when they come down, like on the planet itself, they don't know that the world is made out of like 90% like hydrochloric acid. <laughs> Yeah, the, sometimes, it'll, that, sometimes it'll rain down on them if it's not even just you know on the ground. That the people that you're attacking are like they have like they're mo they themselves those carbon based beings themselves are like to uh, like what like seventy percent water, something like that. Yeah, something like that, right? Like so, I mean, so that would be seventy percent hydrochloric acid, and nobody brings a wetsuit. <laughs> but naked right so right if they were like in like like the uh like the aquaman movie you know like in these suits of armor right knowing like oh shit okay we're we're out of our element we're going into another element you know it at least would have made a little off. bit more sense ex ex Spock with this fucking tricorder could have gone I and mean, been like, okay, that's what we're going to. Yeah, dude, it's like 90% hydrochloric acid. You might want to wear a raincoat or something. It's all the shit that kills us. So let's not go there without well, protection. Isn't there like a scene? There's a scene where they're running around in the cornfield 
And I, I could be wrong, but I swear it's foggy in that scene. So now there's like hydrochloric acid just sitting in the air. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> right. so and, but you would think the moment they get out of their ships or they're beamed down or whatever, they'd be like, get me the fuck out of here. Right? But right. well, and not to mention, like, okay, so <sighs> Bonehead. It, it's just like go to Georgia. Like where they were was not like a dry. Like, it was fucking humid. <laughs> no. Like Right. Exactly. If they were, if they were like, you know what, we're going to invade like like sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to invade the Sahara. Something like a desert, maybe. Yeah. You know? But even then, there's just like, okay, you know what, oases yeah, I... and and shit. So there's still some water there. So we might as well like you know be careful and like pack some kind of protective gear. Uh, and this is right. from the guy that wrote. Um, uh, Unbreakable, which is a fantastic movie. Yeah. And like one well, of the best comic book related movies uh, ever, I think. You know? He's 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 notorious for that, though. Like, M. Night Shyamalan does so many movies that have, so, like, um, oh my gosh, what was it? The. I hated it so much, I forgot the title. The one where the trees are like killing humanity? No, the, the one um, where. Like they're a little civilization in the middle of a forest. Oh, and... uh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah. What the heck is that called? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know why. Yeah, I just, now I lost it. I just talked about, it. but it's the thing the community, that but it's something like that. Yeah, something the village, the village. The village. The village. <laughs> um, it's one of my one of my biggest pet peeves of that entire show is that this we're following apparently the first teenager to ever rebel against the entire society that exists that have told her you can't go through this because she ran through the forest and came out at the other side where there's just a fucking, there's like a, a road and a dude and a truck. And he's like, yo, what's up? And she's like, the hell, like, what is shit? I, I remember seeing that. And I was like, so they, and that one, they hit all of our plot holes because it's like, you wrote yourself into a corner and had no idea where to go. You randomly undid all of the progress and all of the tension of this entire thing by saying, well, if they would have just kept going, then they all would have realized that the village is full of shit. Yeah. Right. And, right. And you like, logically you're trying to sell me on the fact that this is a village that has been there for years and years and years. And this is the first fucking teenager to ever actually make it out. You are out of your damn mind. <laughs> All of those well, it could have been the would have known. Because wasn't her dad the one that set it up to set the whole thing up? It was. It was. Um, I think that her dad, and then it was all of like the village adults that like would so go. Could have been literally the first generation to figure it out. It's just so, but it. I, I just it's, don't. It's it, like what? So what? You you hit a rite of passage at a certain point, and you all just have decided communally that anything outside is going to be shit. So we're just going to stay in here with our heads in the sand. Like I but don't buy that for half a second. It's, it's, it's typical of like of his crap movies that he doesn't have his ending when he starts writing. And that's why it's yes. an ironclad rule for me. Uh, people like Stephen King, uh, Ray Bradbury, uh, you know, I've read their books on writing and Books on writing can be entertaining. I like to read them, but they're not going to teach you how to write. Um, you know, uh, you know, it, they're and those books in particular, they're not nuts and bolts because they're both they both have the same approach, which is don't think, just do. And I'm like, <laughs> right. Easy for you to say. You're fucking Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Right. Some of us well, have to like work at it. Some of us aren't geniuses. Hello. So that actually brings up the comics question that they just had. So, um, or not Mystery Comics, I'm sorry. Uh, Papa, uh, who wants to know, concerning your story, what are your preferences for knowing exactly how it ends, or do you let it work itself out? Um, oh, I, I, I am notoriously bad. Because I, like, I'm currently trying to write a book. And the idea that I have... I know the main things that I want to have happen in it and I page of it. 
and I know nothing else. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I'm writing a script right now that I'm working on. It not, uh, that's my own. It's gonna be my own personal project. I'm launching next year. Mm -hmm. And I had almost the same thing. There was, I have the basic story down. I know basically how it's gonna end. And there were certain scenes I want. I had this like, I have this like bar fight scene, and I needed to get the characters from to the bar to do the scene. Right. So I kept thinking, all right, how am I gonna get them there? And and I had and I had the whole scene in my head ready to go, and then um, I, and and I was like, all right, now how do I get? There, there has to be a reason for them to go to that bar. And there's like, okay, they're meeting a guy. Well, why are they meeting that guy? And <laughs> it was like, and I I just kept going over over in my head. There was there was something like where they found a little note, but I'm like, that's way too on the nose. And then it and and I, I was going over and over, and I could not figure out how to get them to that bar in a way that made sense. Right. So you couldn't have them. Answer, the I'm whole not. answer was cell phone. They found the guy's cell phone, and it had a little message on it. And that's what drew. That's that's all I needed was that one little thing. All right, that that's all I need to get them there. That's the bridge. Okay, so it was a specific bar as opposed to a bar. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. They had to go to a specific bar because they had to meet okay. a guy there. And they had to question the guy. Well, I had to. They 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 had to have the right questions, and they had to know that he had those answers. And so I had to figure out how they would figure out, you know, to go and okay. ask the right questions to this guy to make okay. the scene make sense. And okay. there, was, there was just like this gap, and I couldn't figure out how to how to fill that gap. And it okay, was, it was super simple. It was they found they found one of the bad guys' cell phone. And it had a little message on it in his texts. And they're like, we need to know what this message means. And But before that, there were so many different ways. And none of it, to me, just made any sense. It was like, they're just going there to go there. And that doesn't make sense. I need to fill that <laughs> hole. I need to make that bridge. You didn't, so they you didn't want them to just randomly show up somewhere and have it be where they needed to be the whole time? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It, yeah. It, 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 I don't want them all bumbling around and accidentally. <laughs> Oh, you know who is the worst, the worst offender when it comes to uh, when it comes to that, when it comes to Tolkien. coincidence. Uh, no, oh no, Tolkien's not even like in uh, in uh, Charles Dickens's league. Oh, <laughs> Charles Dickens, man. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, love him to death. You, you know, the Shakespeare of uh, the the Shakespeare of the novel, right? Mm -hmm. But the his use of coincidence. Especially in, uh, I'm thinking, uh, Tale of Two Cities. Oh my God! Like I just oh, yeah, happened to be like that. robbing a grave in this graveyard when th this guy showed up, like ten years ago. I just happened to be in that same graveyard, like looting a grave. <laughs> I was just like, what? You know? And that's credulity, man. You can only stretch that shit so much. I mean, some writers, God bless them. Like like Dickens, they could they could get away with it. But also remember, Dickens was working in the a similar medium to our own, which is serialized storytelling. Mm -hmm. Those novels were not written as novels; they were like uh, I think what weekly or monthly installments, right? Oh, like in a newspaper or something, like like a magazine, what periodical, a periodical. Yeah. People would actually go to see uh, uh, Dickens read the new chapter of whatever novel it was that he was writing live. He's like, I got the new chapter here, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he Mike, welcome. Oh, the, uh... hey, guys, up, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yes, you can, loud and clear. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I just had just declined uh, a request, uh, an invite to come on. And then I thought, well, actually, it's it's lunchtime here. I'm at work and I'm on my lunch break. And uh, what you guys are talking about is so interesting. And <laughs> yeah, I just I just had to jump on. Heck cool. yeah, hell yeah! The more so, the more the merrier. So Give us your thoughts. You're here and we know it's your lunch break. What's your biggest plot hole pet peeve? Like, what's your your least favorite plot hole that you can come across? Oh God! Oh, least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> they're all uh... <laughs> don't put me on the spot. Yeah, no, I mean they're all annoying. Uh, like, uh, um, plot holes, you know, as long as they're kind of so small that you can't really, um, poke a, poke a finger through them, I think they're okay. But like what you were talking about earlier, um, uh, with, was it signs? Yeah. 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 
yeah, obviously that kind of stuff just can't fly because it just overshadows the whole friggin' thing. Like, yeah. uh, uh, you know, you can get away with, as, if, as long as there are certain tropes, you know, you can get away with um, uh, superhero costumes, for example. So there's a lot of um, plot holes surrounding superhero costumes. Like, how do they get into them? How do they work exactly? Uh, where do they come from? Like, mm -hmm. where, where does spider mans suit come from? That, you know, you can see it takes a whole movie studio to make something as cool as that happen in real life. But you're just what, what supposed to believe that. Around, he has to pee. <laughs> all these things. So, we, you know, you just kind of. <laughs> How does he shave? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah um, Indi uh, Dave, what you were uh, talking about earlier, um, uh, that's such a, uh, how you were saying, you know, you needed to get someone somewhere and you couldn't figure it out. And uh, man, yeah, I, I spent uh, years trying to write the Lucent as a novel as well, and it just wouldn't work. Uh, that I was also learning to write. And um, Brian, I was going through those books, man. I was learning how to write. I was learning the craft. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard. And you, you're totally right. You can't just wing it if you're not a genius. Because you, no. you will, <laughs> at every turn, you will, you will come into a wall yep. and you will yep. fall through a hole. And, and then you look back at your story and go, well, this doesn't make any sense because why wouldn't they just do this? And <laughs> it's the, 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 pro the, the oh, problem. Go ahead, Dave. With, oh, I'm sorry. The problem with fiction is reality. I mean, you yeah, have exactly. to plot forward. And the fact that it's a fictional world, you're going to have a little bit of, you're always going to have a plot hole just because oh, yeah. it's not reality. And you don't have um, you don't have six billion other people that you know that exist in the world that can affect what's going to happen what you're doing. You have you have a, a story in your head, and you have to get the story going. And everybody does it. Everybody's going to have plot holes. They're completely unavoidable, but you can mitigate them as much as you can. So true. That's so true. Um, it's the yeah. glaring pothole. That's the problem. Yeah. The glaring, exactly. the glaring pothole. And the way I view it, and this is taken. Yeah. So I started becoming a writer about 10 years ago that was my initial foray into it I, I literally the first time i just started i sat down and just started writing i didn't know if i was writing a book or a screenplay or anything it was just i was just writing and god it was awful but um over the over time and through my research i found out about the fates which is an ancient uh idea of kind of the you know the 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 representation of destiny and the, when I learned about these guys, uh, you know, they're represented all throughout cultures in all different ways, uh, sometimes as yeah. uh, weavers and all sorts of things. And when I was learning about them, the thing that struck me about them was they're not gods. They actually kind of sit above gods in that they weave the fate of not only the gods, but also normal humans, normal men. So they, you know, they're weaving destiny. And when I was reading about that, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of how I want to be a writer as well. I want to weave the tapestry of the destiny of this story. And, uh, and, and, and then what you can do is, if you're a good weaver, if you can weave a story that makes sense internally and, and all works from beginning to end, and, and then you can just have characters in there that as long as they're real, and each character has their own motivation. And that's so important. Right. Then you can just weave that tapestry, put the characters kind of at the start, and they will, you know, according to their own personality and motivations, they will follow what you've woven in a way that just all seems to click together. And that's what I found, you know, I've sort of figured out how to do over this last 10 years. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a really... Um, I know it's been a really helpful way for me to think about writing to kind of approach it. But that's it's similar to I think you know who else I think kind of works that way is Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison is a is this a pretty trippy stuff? He's into chaos magic and claims mm -hmm. to have seen light beings. Uh, and he uh, believes that uh, he is actually yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> more like. <laughs> Where, where's where are my stamps uh but yeah he like believes that the characters of his take on a life of their own to a degree that he actually believes that they actually sort of exist in their own dimension 
he actually played yeah. with this in the last issue of uh, Animal Man, where he actually shows up in the comic book with his cats. I hate that. Yeah, I, I I'm not a, when an author shows up in his own work. Stephen King I, does it sometimes, and it's terrible. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's, I'm it, right there with you. It's I, I, uh, I, I yeah, no, I, uh, I agree. But yeah, no, it does seem sometimes when when your characters come to life, for me, they don't come alive right away. I have to write them for a while before they start to speak in their own voice and they actually start to oh, make, yeah, make their absolutely. own decisions. Like when I say, you know, you got to write like the fates and you got to be the weaver of the universe and everything. I'm still me. I'm still just normal old me, uh, you know, still kind of struggling with this whole thing. So when I write down my first drafts, I, I write them down. I just kind of, it all just kind of spews out of my head and then I'll, I'll leave it. I'll put it away. I won't look at it for months and I'll come mm -hmm. back and I'll look at it because I've forgotten it by then. Now I can kind of look at it objectively. And yeah, some, maybe sometimes everything that I've written is just, no, this does not fit that character. This isn't correct. This isn't how it needs, how, how it should be. This isn't how they would actually act. So yeah, it is a, uh, you still got to get in there and, and, you know, mold it and fiddle with it and everything. Absolutely. Yeah, yep. that's, that's very true. And I think that, uh, I think that that's probably like where I'm sitting right now with what I'm attempting to write. I think one of the hardest things is I know where I, I need the story to end. And I know that I need a specific like kind of feeling overall, but all of the, the details of how I'm going to actually invoke that feeling and whoever reads it are complete blanks for me. And, and it's, um, because I'm I, the main protagonist of the story that I'm trying to write is a nine-year-old girl with depression, um, which is really, really, really hard to write because I not only have to write in the mindset of a younger kid that I haven't been for many, many years, but I also have to write in the inside of a younger kid who older than like mentally than a lot of her peers because she's suffering from such a, a severe mental disorder, which makes it, like onion that is very difficult to be like I don't I don't know what layer is going to be the right layer for her to be were, at. Were you a depressed nine year old girl? No. You were definitely a nine. Okay, no. uh, I, I was a depressed nine year old boy. Like it's oh good, we're about to have a big long conversation, Brian. Well, that's the, well, that, <laughs> that well that's the thing is thank goodness we have research. Thank, yes. good, thank goodness we have, uh, I mean, my God, not, not only do we have the uh, library and the card catalog, boy, that's long gone. I mean, we've got Google now, you know? Although I will say, try, like, go on to Google and try to find actual narrative stories from children who suffered from depression because they don't fucking exist because nobody wants to talk about it. There, There's, there's medical journals that say we have... Uh, Shows that kids as young as three can suffer from depression, and oh, kids yeah. as young as there's the youngest uh, child who has ever committed suicide was six years old. Right? At six, at sixth grade, wow. I, I want to kill. Uh, how old are you? How old are you when you're in sixth grade? I'm thinking twelve. Something like that, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. I just remember distinctly in, in sixth grade, I uh, lost so much weight. I my eyes were all sunken, you know, and. uh you know, I remember what my fifth grade teacher was like, Brian, you look great. You know, you lost all this weight. And then I remember thinking, yeah, it's because I'm dying inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. And, well, that, and, yeah, but uh, you but, can uh, find it when you start talking about preteens and stuff like that and teenagers. And most of the accounts, not. like I even went in and I saw the top 20 um, of childhood suicide. And I mean, it's a really first off, it's a super fucked up, mor uh, morbid thing to have to Google. Um, but going through and reading these, most of these kids that have suffered that, um, they're writing about it and and they're 18, 19 year olds that end up committing suicide. And I was like, well, a 19 year old and a nine year old, like those are very different places in your life. So finding something that goes back enough where it's it's not so much the constant harassment and bullying in school. Cause I, I don't, I don't want it to be typical. I want it to be somewhat atypical, but to have the same kinds of, this is what depression looks like for people. So for, people who don't suffer, understand that's kind of for that, for that, you know, I, I personally would go the route of, um, 
of uh, because my <laughs> life did become a nightmare and I had every reason to be suicidal a few years later, but I uh, but I wasn't. But I w was suicidal when things were actually pr pretty good, and you know it's it's what um, I think Edgar Allan Poe said it best: "I am wretched and I know not why." <laughs> That's clinical fucking depression right yes. there. You don't understand it. You want to kill yourself? You know, I remember thinking like, okay, maybe I should throw out myself out the window, but oh crap. You know, then what if I don't actually die and I just get paralyzed? That would really suck. <laughs> and I and I don't want my parents to know. I want it to look like an accident. You know, there was an epidemic of teen suicide uh, in, in my generation. Mm -hmm. And looking back now, a lot of people think, and I think they're right about this, it was a lot of uh, gay kids that uh, yeah. that were uh, that were like, you know, were just like, uh, like I'm cursed, I'm damned, I'm doomed, I'm never gonna have a future, so fuck it, yeah, hit the, let, let's hit the reset button, and uh, well, you know, and and, that, the, and they didn't leave it behind in their notes because they didn't want anybody, they they died not wanting anybody to uh, to know, you know, so uh, yeah. <sighs> Well, and, and so one thing that I, I think, um, just to kind of bring it back to plot holes, one thing that I think makes a lot of um, authors in danger of falling into plot holes, right? Characters that you personally can't find a relation to. So just like what Samir was saying, um, I have, I'm also writing a group of kids, trying to write for a, a group of children convincingly it coming across as either very patronizing because kids are a lot smarter than people give them credit for or very like way too adult like it's such a hard to to fall into and that can create a lot of plot holes because you're giving kids either too much or too little credit and then you put them in a or you're switching back life. and forth or, or yeah. You, yeah, you keep going back and forth and you screw up the logic because if you if you didn't understand this then, but you understand it now, but now you don't understand it again, like I like where are I don't understand like where you are. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is also where bad writing can be sometimes more educational than good or even great writing. The like if you want to see the wrong way to write teenagers and, mm -hmm. and kids, you look at after school specials. Right from like the from the eighties, where you're just like, this is about a 14, 15 year old boy or girl, and it was clearly written by a fifty or sixty year sixty year old woman. Yeah. Right, the show yeah. called J James at fifteen, I remember, and then James at sixteen, and I remember like my, my like my older brother was watching with me. He was like, man, this is like written by like. Like like a like like a like 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 a like a like a grandmother or something like that. <laughs> Fucking eighty, what an eighty-year-old woman thinks of is going through like a fifteen-year-old boy's mind, right? right? Nothing, yeah. fi nothing filthy, nothing dirty. His his uh <laughs> gr his uncle is so awesome. He takes right. him to a brothel when he turns fifteen years old, and he's just like, uh, uh, I, no, no, I like like I want to wait until I'm in love. <laughs> I can't what? stand when when stories are written about kids and they're just presented like just absolute morons who can't understand oh. anything yeah. and who have, you know, no... Like kid, kids are that's ignorant and that's not their fault. They just haven't had the experience. They're naive, they're but they're smart. And I remember being a kid and just being continuously frustrated by adults that treat you like you can't understand you know, if they want to explain something. But, and I always said to myself, remember that as you become yes. an adult, not to do that to kids when you're older. I remember you know, as a kid wanting so much to be an adult. It yeah. was, it was like when I, I hate, and it wasn't, I wasn't, you know, depressed or anything like that. Or I just wanted so much to not be a kid anymore. And I played with the other kids and then all that. I wasn't super mature or anything like that. It was just, I had it in my head. I can't wait till I'm an adult. And now that I'm an adult, I look back and I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I'm an adult. <laughs> and and I, I never I, I never did like the coochie coo whatever talk with my kids. I always talked to them, even when they were yep, two or three years old, like they were regular people. I never was like, and I didn't use like big words or anything like that, but I tried to like at least treat them like they kind like of they understood. understood. And then if they well, don't understand, then you explain it a little bit. Walk it back. Yeah, walk it back. Well, so like a perfect example of this, I had a friend who had a premature child, right? And so because when you have preemies, 
they um, they're usually a little bit stunted in their development. So they take a little longer to speak, to write, to walk, to all that kind of stuff. So she was actually taking her daughter to a specialist because her daughter just would not walk. And she was probably like, probably like 14, 15 months old and she wouldn't walk. She would crawl everywhere. And she was like, I'm really concerned. Like she should have been walking by now, blah, blah, blah. So she's like, we have to take her to a specialist and they check her legs and they're probably going to put her into physical therapy and all that. And I was watching her interact with her daughter. Right. And so I'm waiting with her in the, in the waiting room. And I went, do you think that uh, like, would it be okay with you if, if I just tried something with her? Oh, and she was like, yeah, absolutely. And I was like, cool. So I stood up and I was like, okay, come here. And I stayed just out of her reach. So she could reach out and I would be just a little bit too far. And I take steps back. That little girl went from not walking in five minutes to grabbing my hand and trying to take me upstairs. And I, I <laughs> turned around to my friend and I was like, she can't walk. And she went, how in the hell did you do that? And I go, because I didn't treat her like she was broken. It was like, you, you. you set her on one side of a room and you walked her all the way to the other side. And then you told that tiny little girl to come to you. You put the Grand Canyon in between you and your child and you wonder why she didn't jump. It was like, so I, I, put, <laughs> I put half an inch to her. So she was like, I could reach that. So she tried. And then she, wow, she looked down at her feet and looked back at me and was like, I could do this. <laughs> And she starts walking and she starts looking around and she was like, holy shit, I can go places. <laughs> That's Everywhere. beautiful. She's like, it go really... over, going mirror, mirror, and like taking me up the damn stairs. We went up Aww. five stairs and I turned and looked at my friend and was like, I don't know what to say to you other than your kid is a lot smarter than you think she is. Stop stunting her. <laughs> it really and is amazing how much, uh, especially just even over the last 10 years, you know, in, with the media representation of kids as these sort of helpless infants, really up to a high age, you know, and that, that must have rub off on new parents who, you know, who do treat their kids like that. And it, this is, you know, a bit of a trivial example, but uh, I don't know how, if you guys have kids or how old they are. Um, most kids these days, when they learn to ride a bike, they get onto uh, what's called a, um, it's a bike without a pedal. I can't remember what it's called, but you can get onto it as early as one and a half to pretty much as soon as they can walk. They can mm -hmm. just walk around with this bike between their legs that has no pedals. And then, you know, really, even in a couple of weeks, they'll start sitting down on the seat and balancing. So that by the time they get to about two, two and a half, like my son, for example, he's two and a half. You should see him out there on the streets. He is, you have to like, I have to be on rollerblades to catch up with him, to keep up with him because he's out there on his bike just going crazy. And then, you know, when he turns three, I'll get him a bike with pedals and he'll he'll pick up those pedals within 30 minutes. That's what happened with my daughter. I just see, and he's even better than her. So when he's three, he'll be riding around the, the, the streets on with a pedal bike. And I see kids out there, eight, nine, ten, big kids with training wheels on their bikes who are like struggling to balance and their mum has to kind of stand right next to them and they're all scared. And, and this is kind of a, a representation of what's happening out there. It's, well, this it, is why I never learned how to ride a bike. <laughs> well, my, my son, my son's on the spectrum. And one of the things that, I mean, he's really high functioning, but one of the things he has a problem with is he's very awkward, right? His, his brain goes faster than his body. So he has a hard time sometimes at least when he was younger, like uh, sinking his body movements and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he, he was really awkward. Like it took him a forever to learn how to swing on a swing. He couldn't get every, all the motions down. Yeah. We put him on a bike. We got him, we got him a bike when he was, you know, older and he never did the training wheels or anything. We got him a bike and we were at the park and the park has like a hill on it, a grassy hill. And uh, I was just like, all right, get on your bike about halfway up the hill and let, and, and just go down. And he was freaking out because he can, you know, hardly do the thing. Ten minutes later, he's riding his bike like, like he'd been doing it forever. And he, yeah, yeah. Well, it, you just got to be like, just do it. That's what that my dad did confidence. to me as well. Yeah, that's what my dad to me did to me in the early '80s, and uh, I, I actually crashed into a tree. And you know, <laughs> yeah, that might sound bad, but uh, you know, the next time I did it, I didn't crash into the tree because I learned my lesson. These mm -hmm. days, uh, too many parents don't have that kind of mindset. 
Oh yeah, we had we had a really big hill that was like it was super super steep and it curved right. Yeah. And so my dad was like, "All right, moment of truth. Like you're good on your bike. You're doing all kinds of cool stuff. I'm gonna take you up the hill. You're gonna ride down the hill." And I was like, "I'm gonna try." And he was like, "You will do fine." So I'm up the hill. I start coming down the hill. He running alongside me he's like yeah you're doing great good job good job uh i suddenly became very aware how fast i was going and that i wasn't sure how to stop and i ended up driving my bike into a railroad tie (laughs) that blocked off the park and i like feet overhead just totally wiped out biffed it super up and everything my dad comes running down and he was like you were so good and i'm like dad i'm bleeding and he's like it's totally okay you're (laughs) fine he's like you did so good and he goes and patches me up and he was like you ready to go again i was like maybe like a different day because like it still hurts (laughs) (laughs) he was like that's fine he's like i'm kind of bruised and battered and i feel like i broke a rib or something maybe maybe not today (laughs) I, i try to be the walk it off dad I, yeah. I try to do that, but like, I mean, you can do that to to an extent. Yeah, I mean, to a point. You got to comfort them when they get a little older. You're like, all right, pain goes away. Walk it off. My my daughter was in uh, like an MMA class, a little for kids, and she punched and she was doing some punching, and she punched something and she injured her wrist. And I tried to be walk it off, Dad, and then like she's like, no, it still hurts. It still hurts. At the end, we're like, all right, we brought her to the hospital. She had actually like cracked her wrist bone or something. Oh. I felt horrible. I felt terrible. <laughs> like, I, was trying, I was trying to be like, yeah, all right. It's no big deal. Walk, you, you walk know, it but, off in her arm. Yeah. And it's just like dangling and hanging from a thread. <laughs> I, and I, I felt terrible about it, but I mean, I still try at least, at least now I'm a little bit more. Well, let me oh. check you out real quick. All right. Does that hurt that? Hurt? All right. You're, you're good. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I think I remember. I So I've, I've gotten really good at the, when you see a little kid fall, and they look at you and you're like, you're good. And they're like, okay. And then they go walk it off and you turn to like the person next to you and you go, that looked really bad. Like like I, I remember my niece uh toppled off of a uh um trampoline and she was she's probably like two and a half. And she just took off running, and I like looked back just in time to see her head go down and her feet go straight up. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so, like I jump off and she starts, she hit and she sat up and then she screamed. And I was like, You're okay, you're okay. And she like looked at me and I was like, Nope, I lied. <laughs> so I went and like <laughs> took her down and gave her, I gave her like a, a lollipop or something. And she was like, She saw hit my head. And I went, Yeah. And she goes, Owie. And I was like, uh-huh. And she goes, better i was like oh, good job. Oh, man. Goes, oh, i turned to her older sister and i was like for real though don't let her like go to sleep or anything if she looks like she's getting tired <laughs> oh. she like, oh. oh. she fell on her head do not let her go to sleep she could die <laughs> so <I was> like, <laughs> Shit. <laughs> this, this is okay this is sort of linked and a little bit back to what we were talking about earlier uh so about um age six um um, our daughter wasn't really coping that well at school. Uh, she's just really always outgoing, super happy, friendly, and never had any inclination to, to be gossipy or you know backstabbing or anything like that. But when she got to school, she found out a lot of the girls at the school are like that. And it just really got her down, and she was down in her confidence and everything. And uh, we put her into jujitsu. And a year and a half later, she's the... Um, for her age and uh, weight and belt, she's the Australian Jiu Jitsu champion, right? Oh, now. Nice, sweet. Uh, she's got like a whole thing of medals and everything, and she's fully into it. And it's it's just been such a great uh, you know thing for her to do, and her confidence is up. And she's got she's got some of her friends at school doing it. But, Martial uh, yeah, arts. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Especially that one. Especially that one because they they can get hurt. A little bit in terms of um you know it's, it's scary sometimes when you're getting choked out but uh you don't get many injuries the only injury she's ever really gotten were when we were kind of doing it together and i just like i'm just like that much bigger than her I kind of squash her or bend her arm a bit too much so i've had to stop doing that we're going to wait until she's a bit bigger to get back onto that but uh well yeah, it's all I, ground I really... fighting it's all ground fighting right so it's not a lot of striking there's no striking at all no striking 
No right. Strikes. It's all, yeah, it's all, yeah, it's all joint locks and pain. Just joint locks, exactly. Jeff, leverage. But uh, right. yeah, it's uh, she's she, because she's just sort of naturally in, naturally intelligent. Uh, she's mm-hmm. it's just, she's just kind of taken into it because they call it the chess of martial arts. It's all about yeah, um, yeah. You know, figuring out how to use your opponent's weaknesses against them and. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a wild ride, but it, it is you know it really does help. The, the kids in those classes, they're all so happy and they love going there, and and there's a little kind of um, you know friendship groups, mm-hmm. and and healthy competition as well. You know, exactly. yeah. some of the kids are better than others. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that's that's something that I think is missing is everybody gets a participation trophy now. And I always I always said to my mom, I was like, you know whenever I have kids, if they decide that they're going to do a sport and they, they aren't going to keep score because they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Like mom's going to keep score and mom will let, let child know how they did <laughs> be like, Hey, so good job. You played hard. Um, you guys didn't win, but that's okay. And we're going to talk. What we can do to be better next time. <laughs> and just be like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Everybody wins shit. That's the way that you grow is, is through, trials and adversity and all that and like well, I, but this you, is were talk, you were talking about depression and suicide earlier this uh-huh. is the kind of thing that's going to lead to that because there are just some people that are going to take it so far to the extreme that they can't understand why they didn't get what they were going for yeah when they get to the workplace and it's going to be well I, you just didn't work as hard as this guy did but, or you know uh he did he did more than you did or whatever it is and I don't understand why we're, we should be getting all equal, all equal stuff. Well, th- well, this you know, this is why I wish they th- that they had offered martial arts as a uh, elective when I was uh, a kid in school. Phys yeah. ed was a joke when I was a kid because you know I was like fat and pale and weak, and nobody, you know, they didn't teach me shit. They didn't teach me basic exercises. They no, didn't, we did team. It was all team badminton. sports, man. Yeah, it was all right. it was all team sports, right? Like, so it's like you're either good or you suck. And if you suck, you're always gonna suck, and your your value as a human being is always going to suck. And just get over there and for, and and just kill yourself. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> teaching kids martial arts, Gross. that's something that is that is uh that is way more practical. First of all, if I had if I ever had daughters, I'd be like, "You're taking a martial art. I'll let you pick it." Like, yeah, get them learning how to defend yourself. <laughs> the uh, th- there's nothing that's going to teach them humility, tenacity, um, or like d- just every single class is a lesson. Like learning oh, that yeah. you can lose and come back. Like we had her train, and she had her heart set on this competition. It was the international. It's her first big um, pan packs. Man, she trained so hard every day and she got there and she's up this girl and this girl was small on her and she dispatched her in seconds. Like this girl just wrapped my daughter up in, in it. I couldn't even watch it. It was like, it was so quick and bang, it was all over. She had her in an armbar in seconds and I saw the look on my daughter's face as she realized she'd lost. And, you know, all that emotion just spilled out and you know, she was just in tears. And then, you know, gradually it, it uh, you know, just kind of dawned on her. And, you know, she, her coach was like, you know, this is what, these are the moments, like, like lean into this. This is the moment you're going to learn, you know, what life is about and what yeah. jiu is about. And this is going to make you so much better going forward. And, you know, if you had a one right. in 10 seconds like she did, she, that, that girl didn't learn anything from that. She was... She was heads and shoulders better than my daughter, and so she didn't learn anything. But my daughter learned something that day, and yeah, this is the stuff that every kid needs to get involved with. I reckon humble pie. It it, it tastes horrible, but it's nutritious. Well, so yeah, this, is, this is what I don't understand: is why why is it that we are trying to protect kids from failing when those failures are the least painful failures that they're going to have in the entirety of their life? Yeah. The, the least painful failures that you are likely to have are probably going to be when you are a child because it's not your livelihood on the line. It's not the rest of your life. It's not a really deep, meaningful relationship. Usually, usually they're small things They're I lost the championship game and that sucked. I didn't place where I was hoping to place or I tried to you know, do this modeling gig or whatever. And I totally messed up and fell flat and everybody laughed at me. Those are the moments where kids get to learn a little bit of that resolve and a little bit of that oh. steel and that metal 
that they're going to need when they go out for a promotion and they get overlooked and you have to go, okay, so why, why was it, was it actually an injustice? And if it was an injustice, I need to learn how to play the game better. Or was it, I didn't do something well enough and that's why I got overlooked and I need to improve in that area. You'll be able to do that better as an adult, but we protect them so much that now we have an entire slew of adults, my generation and back that don't know how to be told that you you don't get a job just because you want it. That's not how that works. You don't just get to go. All these people that are, are breaking into the comics industry in the main, half of them are diversity hires and they feel I like know. they're entitled More to than have half. that job. Absolutely. And it's, Absolutely it's, you don't just come in or just because you're a certain race or whatever, it doesn't entitle you to a job. I, I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy who's like an academic who writes a blog about race in comics, right? And you know, he got a uh, you know a job teaching at NYU, and he's a one hundred percent diversity hire. And it wouldn't it wouldn't annoy me if he had the attitude if he just acknowledged it and was just like, yeah, you know what, this is this is the game. And I'm playing the game as the rules are laid out, and why wouldn't I take advantage of that? But no, like he thinks like this, like I, I, I deserve like like I, I'm owed. I was owed this, and <laughs> it's 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 it's, it's, incredi- it's incredibly irritating. He's not a bad <laughs> person. He's not a bad human being, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is why heroic failure is so important. Right. You look at something like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones is the biggest loser in the in the history of heroes. He fails through that entire film. Step after step after step. At the end, he fails. He always Mm -hmm. fails. And it's important to see heroes fail because not all of us know what it's like to run into a building, a burning building and to save a child. But we know what it's like to fail. Yeah, and I think of like like one of the uh, Batman stories that uh, I think was that that was very important very uh, important to me when I was a kid was uh, during uh, was uh, Dennis O'Neill uh, and uh, Neil Adams the classic uh, Batman run where Batman's trying to uh, save this girl this child from drowning and he fails and the girl dies. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I get all verklempt even just thinking about it because all his training, all his strength, everything that he had worked for all of his life to be this hero and he still failed. That sometimes you're just going to lose. Yeah. So this is, this is one thing that I love that Mystery Comics said where uh, a quote from Thomas Edison, I didn't fail a thousand times. I just found a thousand ways it didn't work. And I I think that that's one of the really important things. And to to tie it all back to writing, that's one of the really important things to pay attention to um, when when you're writing is it's only a failure if it defeats you and you give up. But if if you make a mistake or if you do something and it's not the best and you can improve on it, as long as you are humble enough to look at something, to take criticism, to do that introspection and that reflection on it, and then to turn it around and say, okay, we're going to try it again. We're going to try it a different way. We're going to try a, a tweak or a change or whatever and see if that works. If that's what happens, that's a learning experience, not a failure. If you say, somebody said they didn't like my story. And so I'm never writing again. You're right. You failed. You absolutely failed. Yeah. Well, the bat the Batman story that I mentioned. The moment of tr- the, the 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 real payoff is when Bruce Wayne is like, you know what? I'm going to put the cape and the cowl back on, and I'm going to go out. There yeah, that's the hero moment. moment. That's the actual that's hero, the hero moment. moment. Right. That's and that's our uh, Rocky Balboa. You know, it's not how hard you uh, can hit; it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Absolutely. I, I, yes. Uh, with Martial the, arts uh, once again. With the with the storytelling, I, I think I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I wrote somewhere between one hundred fifty thousand to two hundred thousand words, just kind of learning to write, just just trying to get some semblance of a story out onto the page, and it was all terrible. It was all terrible. <laughs> and I would read back at it, 
I would, you know, put it aside and go back. This is awful. Like this is not, and no one would want to read this. But, but I, I, I believed in the story and I believed in the characters, and so I was just, I just kept doing it, even though I didn't, I didn't like what was coming out, and I kept trying to learn. And then it was, it was actually only until I um, picked up a, a graphic novel that it just, this graphic novel in particular, just kind of punched me in the face, and I sort of saw my story all of a sudden. I was like, holy crap, my story needs to be a graphic novel that's how it works and uh right. you know i just kind of i my mind just was set on fire and i was like okay so i was writing it now as a graphic novel uh, i didn't have to spend all this time doing long descriptions about you know pla places and things i could just have a panel of art and yeah. all of a sudden everything clicked and all of a sudden the characters all made sense and all their motivations could become really clear and easy to understand and it, it all worked and but if i had have given up you know, at 150,000 words, I wouldn't have been in the place and I wouldn't have got, developed those skills that I needed to be able to get it all to work when I got that, um, you know, epiphany that it needed to be a graphic right. novel. Do you know how many people don't become writers, don't become artists, don't become this, don't become that because they're afraid of sucking? Uh, you know, and this is why, like, yeah. I have a friend, I have a, I have a millennial friend who, who, you know, who wants to be a writer that started writing. I told him, like, you know, I mean, he's afraid of writing crap. I'm like, brother, get get all that crap out now. You need to start writing now so that you'll get and you and your your initial writing, unless you're like a prodigy. You know what I mean? Somebody That's like not. like uh, uh, Paul Schrader, right? His first screenplay. First thing he ever wrote, Taxi Driver, right? Oh, <laughs> screw you, dude. That's exactly, yeah. Taxi what now? Screw you, Paul Schrader. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Fucking but. Hell. First but, comic but, but, book Rob Willis ever drew, Shin Shinobi uh, Sasquatch. Just like, what the, get out of here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those, those two. Uh, you, know, you know the story with that, right? When, that comic, book, when that comic comes out, He's going to reveal himself. He's actually another famous artist that we all know. <laughs> yeah, that, that would make so much sense. And that would make me feel so much better. It would make all of us right. feel so much better. <laughs> Mike, Comes Mike, out and you're like, Mike, Stanley didn't die? Oh. He's yeah. actually, he's actually <laughs> Dale Psych. Psych. Holy shit. It's like Alan Morris pseudonym. <laughs> uh, like, uh, uh, but Michael, can, uh, do you remember or do you care to mention the graphic novel it was that you came across that gave you this epiphany? Yeah, yeah. It's called. Um, it's a French. Uh, it's a French graphic novel uh, by a uh, by a conceptual artist who, like me, was just writing comics on the side as a sort of a passion. Uh, it's called. It's called the Prophet. Uh, I think they made a new name for it when they put it in English because there's a big prophet. Um, you know, um, Khalil uh, Gibran. Western comic already existing. I don't know the English name, but in in French it's just called Prophet. His name is Mathieu Lafray, uh, and yeah, he's a he's a real talent. And uh, yeah, as soon as I picked up this thing, it was you know just imagine lightning just like going right into my brain. And I was like, wow! And my whole story just sort of you know uh, came into picture around my around me and, and the moment. And that's you know I, I haven't stopped making my comic every day since that was about five years ago. So. Uh, awesome. Shay and Dave, have you have you two read French comic books? Do you have yeah. experience? In French I've comic? never read anything in French, but you, if you're talking like uh, Asterix, the Gaul, or I like Moebius, or uh, Bilal, or uh, or uh, heavy metal, heavy I've metal. Read, I've read some heavy metal. Metal Olant, as it's called in no, French. I've, I think that the only thing that I've read that I know is from France. I think is uh, Asterix. So no, like, uh, Maida Barons or uh, the Inkle or anything no. like that. Oh, that's like my friend, uh, uh, Sim, Simon Poitier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Does Blood Hunt. He and I, we haven't done it yet. We keep talking about it. We're going to do a special on French comics. Basically, just to scream at everybody in Comics Gate and say, y'all need to read some French comics. <laughs> French comic books are freaking awesome. You realize yeah, I wish I was at home comic book, so right? I could, um, could put Sorry? the camera on and show the, some. You realize, you realize I'm writing a frog comic book, right? He's got a million of them. 
a million of them. <laughs> See you till Thursday. Um, so I I want to move on a little bit on the whole plot holes uh, oh, aspect do. of things. Well, Michael so, gets his French comic book. Oh, I can't. Right? I'm at work now, but uh, yeah. Oh, okay. and so you know what? Uh, when we when I post about the stream again uh, after it's up and everything, when you get home, just if you could take a picture and link it, like put it in the in the comments, that'd be awesome. Yeah, we'll do. Um, sweet. So here here is my question to all of you. When you write and you find yourself in a plot hole, how do you correct it? <laughs> I, I, I well, love across the panel, everyone just took a big sigh and went, damn it. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really happen to me. Well, it if you plan the story correctly, you can avoid anything big. Like it, like, like again, we'll come up with signs. It's like he didn't think that through at all. Exactly. <laughs> but if you if you plan the story correct, I mean, for the book for the other book I'm writing now, there's a whole ton of lore, back lore, and how stuff works. Not ninety uh, percent of it's not going to end up in the book. Exactly. But if if yep. I'm writing something, I can always look back and say, okay, well, the rule is this. You know, essentially, the rule is this. So if this is going on and these two guys are fighting and, you know, suddenly this happens, as long as I've got the story planned out, all the big plot holes are going to be gone. Sometimes you just can't avoid little ones because you have to move the plot because yes. it's not real life, you know? So, you know, it doesn't happen naturally. You're kind of forcing, you're forcing the story. Uh, but you, you can avoid big ones by having all your planning done. Sometimes you're just going to have to live with the little ones. Sometimes what people think of as plot holes aren't actual plot holes. That's to say there's the off-screen comic, right? The off-panel comic, the same way there's the off-screen movie, right? What, like, you, you know, the, like you never see your hero go to the toilet, right? Mm -hmm. because, yeah. because we know, right? It's, it, how does that move the story forward? So there's all. Hey, hold on, I'm going to interrupt you just real quick, please. The show 24. That's 24 hours, and he never takes a piss in the whole. <laughs> oh, that is a plot hole. And that it goes in minute to minute through the whole. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah, yeah, if you, oh. if you, if that you make that part of your whole premise, you're right. That that would be a plot hole there. <laughs> Right, oh whereas God. rope is like nine minutes. Right, I, rope, rope is like, yeah, rope has got to be at least. Uh, actually, made, that's like one of the shorter Hitchcock movies. I know that, right, and because that, that's like in real time, and but that's like ninety minutes, and then I'm sure yeah. afterwards, you know, the, the characters like, okay, I need to go take a slash. Yeah, but <laughs> but twenty four, damn, um, you must have a hell of a hell of a bladder. Dave, you just the, blew the my fact mind. that. Uh, I know. The fact that both um, Brian and Dave have said they don't really run into them too much just uh, says to me that their characters have um, have have proper motivations for what they're oh. doing. So that's why so you run into plot holes, essentially, is because your characters aren't real. They don't have their own motivations. And that's where you know so much of the tension and, and what happens in the plot will come from. You'll have conflicting motivations. So that's what I found um, during my process of learning to write, that if I did ever come run into a plot hole, uh, it was because I hadn't properly, um, you know, discovered, uncovered, fleshed out the motivation of a character. And, and, if, and if they're, you know, a character that's essential to wherever the plot is at the time, yeah, you can run into some real issues there. Because, you know, why is this guy... Uh, doing this why, why is he doing this now when you know you've had him been doing this a different way uh, all up until now it's because you haven't properly you know made it clear what why he's doing what he's doing that, that's what i've found at least so if you get those motivations down you shouldn't run into any huge plot holes i guess that's true i guess uh of all of the people out there that are in my shoes uh, where you're just starting out and you're, you're terrified that you're going to fuck everything up, uh, you are. Okay, because you're going to fix it later. But the biggest thing, oh. and this is this is now the theme of two different, we've done two episodes and this has shown up in both of them. Your Bible. 
create what, what all of your characters' motivations, what they do, what they look like, anything that you have, have identified and shown as something that is part of them, part of the story, get that shit together. And it isn't you wasting time. It isn't you not filling it. It is you ensuring that you write something that is going to be believable, that's going to be engaging, and that is not going to piss off your readers. Because the second Amen, you piss off sister. your readers, like... Amen, sister. Preach. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, think of creating your Bible as uh, research, right? Yeah. When I do research, I know that like, for instance, you know, I was I, I, I did this uh, screenplay that's that's going to be a comic, uh, you know, but I'm going to write it as a comic. I'm not just going to take the scre screenplay and just throw it at my artist and be like, yeah, uh, make a comic out of that. No, it's, it's, I'm going to do it. I'm going to adapt it as a comic. Uh, you know, uh, the villain is a Aztec mummy vampire. And because uh, it's a uh, like luchadores versus monsters. Uh, thing uh, called Tequila Moonrise, which I, oh God, I can't oh. wait to do that, right? <laughs> so uh, I read like, you know, I, I have a friend who's an archaeologist. I'm like, okay, what are like the three or four uh, 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 best books you can recommend on the Aztecs? Because he has Aztec tat tattoos. And he's like, oh, well, check this out, check that out. And so I, I read like three, at least three books about the Aztecs. I didn't use 99.9 percent of that shit, but it still pays off in its own way. And mm -hmm. like you know, for something like Six Gun, you know, it's like, oh well, I better do my research on the Old West, right? And that's you know, iffy because when you know the first thing you learn five minutes in is like, oh, so like most of this history is just bullshit. It's it, you're not dealing with history. You're dealing with mythology to a to a large degree. Uh, but even though you're not going to use most of that stuff, it's it's going to pay off in its own way, and it uh, it gives you a feeling of comfort. You know what I mean? Like you're going to be able to fall back on it. Well, so this, uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. Although I was just going to say, this seems to be a recurring theme that I'm seeing here among. Uh, uh, writers, uh, at least, you know, we've got some good writers here uh, in Comicsgate, especially, that they have built we these do. worlds, these expansive worlds full of law and world building that you may not actually uh, get to see um, in the comic, you know, especially in one book or one issue. But, uh, you know, it just goes to show, you know, they, we really, um, you know, I've done exactly the same thing as well. We really do care about having these worlds as the foundation of our story, even if you don't see it explicitly, at least in one book or maybe even two books. And, yeah. Yeah. Hail uh, death metal hero. <laughs> Hi Luke. You're only slightly terrifying. <laughs> well, this was, this was, this was in response to uh, Dan Fraga's uh, uh, buddy yep. costume. Yep. Yeah. This is, this was the uh, other half of that, which is uh, Luke is going to yeah. stream. Donnie in Draco. <laughs> That's so well, creepy. I can't I love see it. this pink, so you know I got an image to maintain. So Frank, it is. <laughs> Man, what's up, Doc? That's so cool. Oh, this is hilarious. Frank oh kind of cheated though by uh, getting a like uh, a bunny onesie. Like they're like jammies. No, that was, he got that was the exact the one. Oh, yep. I thought he, had, actual, he like, had to get the one from a Christmas story. And that's what he oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, he looks like a pink nightmare. <laughs> I remember him saying he was thinking like, okay, like like the bunny costumes, like the Halloween costumes, those look like those could probably be, be, be pretty scratchy. They're pretty much meant to be one war just like one night. And so he was thinking, like, well, maybe if I get the people who make the furry costumes, maybe like though, because those are meant to be worn and used. Yeah, and also no, I don't want to like, hear that. Back and bottom. I don't know what they're used for. Yeah, but that's yeah, but that's a good thing because then you can like you know it makes it easier to like take a take a run to the loo, you know. Oh my gosh! No, okay, Brian's now going to be quiet because we're not going to continue to talk about. Furry. I'm muting myself. That's Whoa. probably a good idea. <sighs> you doing all right, Luke? It's 
Oh my hot, god, right? I'll be straight up with you. I live in Florida. This shit is <laughs> fucking hot. <laughs> oh my god. It's got this lighting inside and it's like I had to turn the AC down so I could wear this thing and actually be on stream. It's ridiculous. No ventilation whatsoever in this mask. <sighs> yeah, that doesn't that doesn't surprise me at all. Um as a person who recently had a mask fail on camera, um <laughs> They they do they do not always have good ventilation. They don't always fit, and I found that if they don't have very good mouth holes, you're kind of fucked. So oh, I can't see shit out of that thing either. It's like there's a hole right over here, and I'm gonna. That's that's why I'm turning my head so I can see. You they see it like this. He's like, I can only see right here. That's it looks like creepy. I'm trying to be creepy, but I can't see. <laughs> I love it. Well, so oh, um, man. I'm happy cool. that you're joining us because we're over here talking about Here's. plot holes when it comes to, to writing. And one of the questions that I just recently asked uh, our panel that they just immediately shut down because apparently I'm, I'm the inexperienced one that's terrified of writing because I'm stupid and I get in my own head as opposed to just saying, screw it and write. Like everyone keeps telling me no, every time we do We're writers. We live in our own head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're writers. Well, That's what we do. So I, I have a question for you because I know the other three have their, their answer and it was really solid. So now I'm curious, uh, do you ever find yourself in a plot hole when you're writing? And if you do, how do you get yourself out of it? I think about the rules that I've set for the universe that I've created, right? Every single and person. <laughs> I love it. Me. Listen, if, if you it's don't so have good. rules for your universe, then there's nothing to tether your story down. It's just it out in the fucking breeze, man. You know, you got nothing to, to ground it. In like, you got to have some fucking thing. rules. Yep. I yeah. love every single one of you because this has literally <laughs> been. And this is like, I bet you. <laughs> I bet you anything, we're going to be on like episode 99 of writing prose and we're still going to have said in every single episode, make a Bible so you know what your rules are and then follow them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, well, you got you to gotta set it up. Well, Shay, you're working like, like, what is it that you're trying to work on right now? Is that that anthology <sighs> project? So, no. So uh, my anthology project, I have given myself the deadline of all of this year for me to get enough of my um, poetry and short stories and stuff kind of together. And then January of 2021, I'm sitting down with Cy because Cy, if you guys don't know, one of the reasons we're doing writing prose is because Cy and I both are writers. Well, Cy is a phenomenal writer who has a bunch of stuff on some website that she refuses to give, it, give me the site name. But she has her stuff posted up there and she gets kudos frequently, which means people are reading it and saying it's really great. People have been hammering her, asking for what's the next installment in your story. And she's like, I just got sick of it. I didn't want to keep writing it. And people keep on hammering me for it. I was like, okay, so you're going to be my editor. That's how that's going to go. Like, I, 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 the last letter that I wrote her, I was like, by the way, you're now my editor. Congratulations. This isn't up for debate. <laughs> like, you get no choice in the matter. Hired. Mm hmm. <laughs> drafted is more like it but yeah, yeah that, pretty much yeah, totally. yeah, uh, like i just i'm gonna i'll lock you in in a room if i have to and just throw my script at you and be like edit it and then you can have water um <laughs> <laughs> but that is isn't that how you're supposed to get work out of an editor that's what i thought i mean that sounds good the the thing that is um kind of funny though is like so i i'm trying to give myself a year so i have time to edit and then I have time to find artists because what I'm doing with my horror anthology is I'm taking the poems and I'm taking these short stories I'm giving them to artists to have them read and then I'm asking them if it sparks anything creatively for them for certain ones there's certain ones that I have specific art that I want to go with it but there's some of it that I really want to kind of see what is this invoke in you when you read it and what is like what comes to mind for you as something that is like a scene or something iconic about it that you think would be a really cool piece of art and then draw it that's an awesome then, idea i'm, I'm going to add that into the book and so i'll have multiple artists with multiple takes on maybe the same poem or the same short story mm -hmm. just to kind of flesh it out and and keep it kind of creepy and horror themed but 
you know, basically like kind of like no, everyone nothing could. else. If nothing else, it'd be a cool ash can, you know. If yeah. You have, uh, a main story that you're trying to tell, and then you have like the different artist takes on that particular story. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about just trying to kind of give it a, a little bit of uh, organicness, and like I, the thing that I love the most about writing, the, my favorite part about writing, is when I write and I give it to somebody else, and I watch the look on their face, and it's the exact look I was hoping to invoke. Like when you give somebody a piece of poetry. Mm -hmm. And it can be someone who hates poetry and then they read it and you see that light hit and you go, Oh, I did it. Like, they yes. It. Yeah, yeah, they got it. They That's reacted the way cool. I wanted them to. Yeah. Yep. Have you guys, uh, have you guys ever read, um, what up, Art? Uh, Stephen King's, uh, on writing? Yes. Yes. I, I listened to that. I, I have the audio book. It's cool to listen to him, like actually read it himself. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's something that I listen to at least once a year just um it re reinforces like being true to your story you know don't violate your own rules in your own universe you know be true to your characters that whole thing mm -hmm. yeah it's it's i wouldn't recommend it as a nuts and bolts book i would recommend it as an inspiration book as an, yeah exactly that's mm. how i read it as well as an inspirational sure. thing yes. something to um because it's a lot, you know, he, he, he's actually, for as big as a dude as he is in terms in the book world, he's, he's a bit self-deprecating, you know. He, he oh, really lays out all his super humble. doubts that he had the whole time. And, you know, he, he had those moments where he was throwing books into the bin. Uh, oh, well, that's where Terry was, came he, from. Exactly, yeah. That's, that stuck in my mind. And I thought, well, if this yeah. guy was doing that, then, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm just wasting my time here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it like that's a, that that's a good book. The uh, the main ones I would recommend for writers would be um, uh, "Hero of a Thousand Faces" by Joseph Campbell. Absolutely, uh, that's a Campbell's, must. I mean, yeah, Campbell's a must in general. Yeah, and go uh, back to it too. If, oh, if absolutely! Read it in a while, it's, it's on my desk. It's on my. It's one of the books I keep on my desk. Another one that's really good is uh, Aristotle's Poetics. That's really worth checking out. You can find that for free online, like in uh, ebook format. You know, it's written by Aristotle, so it's in the public domain. Um, yeah, yeah, there, 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 are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are a bunch of of, uh, of good books out books out there. But it's no matter how good they are, it's never going to replace uh, you doing the work. And not. even the best writers, like. Uh, it it made it always makes me feel happy when somebody like Ed Brubaker, right, who during mm. this legendary run on Captain America, said that you know I mean the sales were through the roof, the reviews were f were fantastic. He brought Bucky back in a way that didn't suck, but was actually awesome, right? And while all this is going on, he's thinking, any day now these suckers are gonna notice me. And notice that I'm not supposed to be here, and they're gonna ca they're gonna catch on to the fact that I have no idea what I'm doing. I literally, you said that, and all that all that I saw was the meme of the dog in like a suit and tie, going, "I have no idea what I'm doing here." And yeah, I'm like, that's me everywhere I go. I'm like, yeah. I don't know why. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. So, I'm see, I totally it. saw the meme of the husky with a black metal band, day 14, and still don't know that I'm a dog. <laughs> I love it. It's now, cool. If, if you want a good nuts and bolts book, an actual nuts and bolts book, uh, look up uh, screen the foundations of screenwriting by Sid. Yes. Fitz. Yes, Sid oh, Field. Well, He's fantastic. Oh, yeah, that's a good straight nuts and bolts. It is. Uh, I mean, the, it's good to have also like an on writing kind of philosophy type book, but that's a very good nuts and bolts. Okay, story is three parts, and it's we and, and it's all relating to movies, but you can relate it to comics. Yeah, and you can probably right, right. Well, mm -hmm. it lays. Well, so, I was going to say, if we're going to be real, when you're when you're looking at a movie script and you're looking at a comic script, they're almost the same. Like literally, here here is the difference, right? A comic is the storyboard that a movie is made from. <laughs> yeah. When they made the Ninja oh, Turtles movie, they literally oh. took the Ninja Turtle book and was like, all right, they took a lot well, of it from the book. It depends how you're releasing it. If you're releasing like a long, like a series, a graphic novel, a long story, if you're trying to release 22-page floppies, it might be a little different because you've got to kind of 
fit in a little bit of a even if it's a the in plot a beginning middle and end yeah. in that copy uh so there are small differences but uh well, yeah. but, but like i said get that get those philosophy on writing type books and that will give you a basic nuts and bolts on on story and that kind of stuff it's not, I mean, it's not, it's not 100% applicable, but it's a really good, really good book. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people diss it, uh, and I'm kind of one of them, but here's the thing. It's important to learn the rules before you break the rules. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, you look at somebody like a friend of mine was saying, like, oh, Picasso, that guy didn't know what he was doing. He was just, like, throwing, like, paint on. Oh, I hear that all the time. Right? And it's <laughs> like, no, you don't understand. This guy was a proper artist he had formal training right mm -hmm. he learned the rules so he could break the rules well it's it's a lot like salvador dolly in that in that aspect yeah. a lot of people are yeah. like dolly was a was a complete hack and it was crazy it was like okay dolly had such an amazing range of his art and if you if you've only ever seen like mm -hmm. clocks like stuff he's which, famous for which is still Fucking beautiful! You haven't seen Dolly. Like, yeah. go check. Yeah, I've seen them go, in the flesh. Go and check They're amazing. Dolly you can see them in the flesh. Have oh, you guys been to the uh, the Dolly Museum in Tampa? I, I have. My birthday one year. Holy fuck! My favorite coffee cup I got there, and it's a Salvador Dolly cup, and it says on it in Spanish, it says the only difference between me and a crazy person is I'm not crazy. <laughs> it's my it's my favorite coffee <laughs> cup. It's, it's, Hell yeah. it's a I just dolly to a team. I do I not do yeah. drugs. I am drugs. <laughs> I am drugs. That's my favorite I am fucking drugs. quote from him. Hell yeah. Yeah. Another yeah. thing. Total another thing Michael. Sorry. Sorry. Another thing I would no. suggest, and this kind of goes back to uh what Shay was talking about earlier with poetry. Um it's something that's overlooked, uh, not really often discussed in fiction writing, but it's there, and you'll notice when it's not there. And that's rhythm, rhythm within the prose. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it's funny, like my colleagues who aren't writers, they don't write, and they'll they'll send me some kind of uh, marketing spiel, um, and they'll and I'll read it, and I go, you know, this is, you can't say it like that. There needs to be, you know, extra syllables in this sentence. There needs to be extra words here. You need to have a, a punch, like, you know, you need to punch it right here, and uh, you know that that's really important. So, like, you know. Uh, read Shakespeare, read Poe, read. Oh, there's yeah. so many amazing. Um, read your classics. Read your classics because they will give you uh, that sense of rhythm that I don't know if that can be taught. Maybe it can. I certainly didn't learn it uh, by rote or anything. It's just something that I learned because, uh, you know, I was really interested in all that stuff. And I, you I feel like, it. You feel it, exactly. Something that you feel. Yeah. And when it's wrong, yes. It, as long as you know about it. You can see mm -hmm. when it's wrong, but if you don't know about it, then you mm -hmm. might put out work and it just doesn't have that uh, rhythm, you know, because there's different pace. There's, you know, it's just, the plot, it's going to be moving fast. It's going to be moving slow. And that rhythm has to uh, connect to that part of the story. So that, that's really important as well if you're uh, going to be writing fiction too. Oh, and you've got to use the rhythm of the story to, uh, you know, control how the audience sees the story. You know? Exactly. Oh, the rhythm dictates, yeah. So that's, that's actually something, if you've ever read, like, I'm a, I, I absolutely love Poe. If you've ever read Poe's poem, The Bells. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, I've, I've had people, like, I've had friends where I was like, this is brilliant. And I give it to them. And they're like, the bells, bells, bells. Why does he keep saying bells? And I'm like, dude, give me, give me the poem. Like, give me the poem. Let me read it to you. And mm -hmm. then you start reading it and everything starts out happy and blissful and it gets mournful and then gets really fucking dark. And by the end of that, I had my friend who was like, that was so cool. And I'm like, mm -hmm. because the, the cadence matters, the pacing matters, mm -hmm. all of that matters. And if you just read the words on the page, you're not engaging in it. And it's uh, every Halloween, every Halloween, you've got how many live streams? Where people are like, I'm gonna do a dramatic reading of the Poe, and every single time I I watch it, I'm like, Oh, you're messing up the rhythm. Yeah. Like, there's a specific rhythm. To oh the God! Raven. I mean, oh, Christopher yeah. Walken to, read the Raven. There is there is there's no beating Christopher Walken. To be fair, Raven, I so. have tried to read poetry out loud for a video, and I just gave up halfway because it is really difficult <laughs> to get it exactly how you want to. And I, I've never heard. You know, it's so hard to find someone who can do it really well. So I really I give props to anyone who can do it really well because it is difficult. 
absolutely it's just it's one of those things when you hear it not done well it's like it just it hurts your soul because you're like i know how it's supposed to sound and it just oh it was was almost good (laughs) and poe is totally misunderstood people think that he wrote all this stuff like in an alcoholic uh like opium induced fugue state nothing could be further from the truth that dude was methodical he wrote an essay about his process that is all I also recommend if you're a writer. Make sure that you do that. that. And he explains his his process, his short story writing process. Of course, he was a journalist first, right? So that gave him, uh, you know, made him a very good uh, self editor. Uh, one of the best uh, lessons I ever got in writing fiction was from a uh, from a journalist. That was sitting in on a, uh, I think it was a radio class that that that, 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 I, that I was taking in community college. It was like, and he was like, "Here's a news story, uh, you know, write the news story for the radio." And I, you know, gave him uh, my uh, my uh, story, and he just went with a pen and went proceeded to at, knock out every unnecessary word. Mm-hmm. Hell back. yeah! Ding! Oh, okay. Uh, Shrunken White's uh, Elements of Style. Elements of Style, yeah. Yes! Fuck yes! It's it's funny because that that book is all more or less about brevity and and whatever and making sure you're not using too many words. And the book is like this thin. Yes! Get to the fucking (laughs) point! (laughs) Use expedient language to get to the fucking point! Yeah. And commit, you know what I mean? Don't well, you, whenever I use a word that's a little dampy pamby, that's a little eh, I'm not so sure. I'm like, oh yeah, strunk and white, elements of style. There it goes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Be ruthless. <laughs> Don't baby. use a ten dollar word when a five dollar word will do. Mm-hmm. Always. Oh yeah. Yep. And, and 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 keep that thesaurus only for the purposes of finding a word that's on the tip on of your tongue. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's it. <laughs> so um I, I'm going to slightly change gears here because I feel terrible. Please. Papa um, asked a question forever ago and we just, we were just rolling. So I didn't bring it up yet. Uh, he wants to know, do you guys have a specific format that you would recommend for your Bibles when you're, when you're trying to make sure you avoid plot holes, that you keep all of your shit straight? Is there any specific we, format? We could tell you what it is, but everybody organizes stuff in their own head differently. That's true. So some people would do it as a chart, maybe, or the character, and then they would set a chart up. Some people, like I just, like, uh, I'll, I'll basically write it down in a notebook, prose kind of mm-hmm. style. Some people might, you know, do it all on, on two by eight, three by five cards. It's really how you organize it in your own head better, best. There's a pro or a timeline. <laughs> There's you a can't pro- fuck up a plot hole if you have a timeline of events. Yeah. That's true. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is why I also always like to make sure that I have my ending because it's a lot easier to work your way through a maze if you start at the end and everything's building up to the to, to, to that ending. You don't have to stick to that ending. As you're going through that journey, you may end up with a different ending. You look at uh, someone like, uh, oh, well, to go back to Dickens, right? If you look at Great Expectations, if if you uh, most editions have the original ending and of course the uh, the different ending the standard ending right mm-hmm. the original ending was very downbeat and the new ending nobody likes a bad ending well yeah but <laughs> yeah but here's the thing but here's the thing it's all about the right ending That's true. and no way you can read those two endings of great expectations and not realize like you know what the happy ending, that is the right ending. And uh, as for format, don't worry about format. Format is bullshit. People get hung up on format. Oh my God, go to a screenwriting forum one of these days, and it's all they talk about is no, format, no. format, format. Format is bullshit. Uh, also, <laughs> if you're writing a, uh, a comic book script, you really format really doesn't matter because you're communicating to like one or two people at the most. You know what I mean? Your artist yeah. and your and, mm-hmm. and and your uh, and your uh, letterer. <laughs> the, the end reader is not reading the script. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit uh, like if. Uh, yeah, I do, I've like I've got um I've got just a an ongoing, what would I call it? 
uh, just a saga and it starts mm -hmm. well before my book begins and it ends after my book ends and i'm just sort of taken the bits that need you know the the best bits the bits that i was writing the book for and they're the bits that go into the books but uh it's just an ongoing saga it goes in all kinds of directions just whatever i want to write up you know whatever i want to tell a story about in this time and it's just kind of and i'm just oh, i'm pumping it out i'm not caring too much about how it sounds or anything it's just an information dump for me and then uh, you know for, if, for each key character i'll have another file and that'll that'll delve more into their um motivations and uh personality stuff like that but it's just if i need to be reminded of some kind of history thing but i kind of know it all you know off the top of my head now but uh, that, that's so how I what do i'm it. what i'm hearing is you have a timeline of events and you have the things that happen in each bit of this timeline and you know where you want to take a a cross section of that to tell your story yes yes so yeah. like if if you so can imagine <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't know if it's the best example, but a bit like um, uh, That's the how Lord I of the it. Rings, the Lord of the Rings versus what everything mm -hmm. Tolkien had. So he picked a certain period of time. It was a, it was yep. the it was that age. It was you know the the war. He picked the, the, the most the interesting Rings. time, just exactly. like George but, Lucas picked the most interesting time, of Star Wars, to make his first three movies. Exactly. exactly. But you know it right. went thousands of years into the uh, past, and I don't know how far it went into the future, but uh, you know probably a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's exactly how I I view it. And so mm -hmm. you've got all that, you've got all that uh, raw material and that foundation to build your story on. So you you, know, you shouldn't um, run into too much trouble if you take the time, and it will take a long time, to hammer all that stuff out first before you even um, you know start uh, plotting out your books. Maybe even has anybody here in writing a comic script ever written a scene or a page backwards? You mean like memento? Like what you want the last panel to be, or no? Like, like you're you've got like, uh, and I've I've had like a block, like a writer's block, and I'm like, I know what I need this scene to accomplish, and I know in the last panel I want to do this. So okay, then, I'll, so, so you're then starting I'll at the like, end point, and you're working your way backwards. Yeah. So I'll write the last panel, and then I'll say, okay, what do I need to get to there? So then I write the panel before that, and I've, I've I don't do it all the time, but I have done it where it's like, I know what this scene has to accomplish for the story, and I know where I need it to end, but what I, I, I can't quite, I've got that little block, I can't quite figure out how to write it there. So I'll start and I'll write the last panel, and sure. then I'll go to the panel before, and then I'll say, okay, how did I get to that panel? Then I'll go to the next, and sometimes for me, that helps break up the block. I've, I've never done sure. that, but that is operating from that same principle of working backwards. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I um, sorry to interrupt, Brian, but yeah, oh, I have something a, a little similar to that in that. Say, I've got a mentor character, right? And uh, as a mentor, he is going to be, you know, giving out uh, advice or whatever, you know, to the hero. Um, and if I had have just tried to write, okay, so the hero, the the plot, the main plot is going along, and then the uh, mentor is going to be, uh, you know, giving the wisdom, right? And if I had have tried to write beforehand what wisdom the the mentor will be um, imparting, I would have just been pulling it out of my ass. Uh, like, oh, yeah, you know, it's good, it's good to know this, I suppose, so you have a bit of this. So I didn't do that. What I did is I had the plot. Uh, you know, the character story continues. The hero is, you know, facing a certain... <laughs> obstacles and certain parts of the uh you know the story and then mm -hmm. i uh, i intentionally left all that uh mentoring stuff blank and then after i'd had it all plotted out i went back and i looked at you know what did what did she really need to know at this point in the story like what what real uh, you know nuggets of wisdom did she need to receive here and then I had, because I know that mentor character, I know his history and, you know, everything that goes on there. And then I can say, okay, what, you know, what would have he thought would be the best thing that she needs to know at this point in time? And then it became super easy. And then there's no problems anymore from, you know, from that point on, you know, I just kind of work from there. That, that's, that's, uh, it's not really working backwards, but it's, uh, you know, doing, doing things in stages to make it easier on myself and make the story better and make sense. 
By the way, well, Michael, I'm sorry for the like laughing. I wasn't laughing at what you were saying. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 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 the telltale <laughs> sound. <laughs> no, Listen, so what? Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, exactly. I believe you. None of us do. No. I believe you. And Frankie knows <laughs> is right. Poe did invent the uh, the detective story yes. with uh, murders in the room org. Hell yes. Well, so going going on what Mike was saying, I think that um, that's something that a lot of people kind of get pigeonholed in is because you get an idea of, of when you're writing what you think your process is. And it's, you know, I start here and then I know I'm going to do this and I know I'm going to do that. And so when you get a block, it gets really, really difficult to get past that because you put yourself in such a rigid constraint. A lot of times, just like what Dave was saying, if you start at the last panel and you start working your way backwards, you're changing your perspective. So instead of mm -hmm. you focusing on this is where I currently am and this is where I need to go and I don't know how to connect A and B, and now you've basically given yourself an impossible task, what you're doing is saying, okay, this is where I need to end. So what would happen right before that is this. Okay, yes. and you're, you're, you've got to... Yeah different perspective yeah. that's going mm -hmm. to work your way back and then you go oh and now i can easily go from here to here like you're it's like taking baby steps mm -hmm. instead of you know it, it, it's the same thing like we were talking about before with the little girl who couldn't walk exactly. like stop putting a grand canyon in between you and your story give yourself that quarter of an inch and take that little step forward and pretty soon you're going to be off running because you're going to get past that that little bit Mm -hmm. Make yeah, it easy I'm on yourself. I don't know if you guys have read any of the um, uh, Song of Fire and Ice stuff, the Game of Thrones stuff, but I just get the feeling there that um, he knew he was going to be writing a lot of stuff and yeah. there's going to be too many characters really to manage. So he just I was about made. To say, with that many characters, yes, you're going to be writing a lot of stuff. So he just made the his method of writing, his method of actually writing the book, super easy. And he just had oh, one character at a time, awesome. chapter by chapter from their perspective bang and so he could uh it, it, when i read it i'm like wow you know as a writer I'm like wow this like you know i feel like i could actually do this if i were you know to ever want to write this grand story with a trillion characters this is probably how i would have done it as well because you know you're not going to get you're going to get bogged down in random uh you know right. different approaches and stuff like that like he's i thought it was smart yeah, no, but having said weeds. that he's kind of left one for a long time so yeah, well, I mean, with that many characters, yeah, you end up out in the weeds if you if you focus on you know one character too much. And that mm -hmm. wasn't his first universe. He had created a fully fleshed out sort of gothic science fiction universe before that. That was in that you know was very very heavily detailed. It had its own glossary. Uh, I you know um, I actually corresponded a little bit with uh, George R. R. Martin when I was a kid, and I discovered like his horror novels. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've got like, you know, letters from him and autographed books and all, and all this crap. And when he came out with like the first, uh, when he came out with game of Thrones, I remember thinking like, oh, 800 pages. Well, it's sometimes it's easier, easier to write an 800 page novel than it is a 300 page novel, generally speaking. Right. Because you don't, don't have to do anything. a lot of yeah, it's it's the it's the Stephen King thing. I'm just gonna sit down and da, 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 right, and you know, uh, you look at his earlier novels, like his first five novels or so are are, are tight. They're really good, right? And then you know, That's around because he was writing it, running out of typewriter paper. Yeah, <laughs> probably and beer, and beer money. Uh, you know, uh. When he, when I realized that it wasn't going to be a trilogy, that he was like, "Oh no, this is going to be six novels," I was like, "George, George, <laughs> I know what you're doing, brother. I know what you're doing. You're busted," because he is somebody that would always write in whatever genre was popular at the time. That didn't mean that he didn't love the genre, but he was always a professional in a way yeah. that, say, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft wasn't. Like Lovecraft was always an uh, rank amateur, brilliant Lovecraft writer. Lovecraft just didn't give a shit, dude. Lovecraft just wrote whatever fucking shit was in his head. Yeah, whatever but I mean, after trip he woke sucked. up with, he sucked exactly. At, he 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 sucked at marketing. His he own sucked work. at dialogue, dude. His dialogue was fucking terrible. People did actually read not any talk like thought. that. Oh, love! Oh, Lovecraft's fantastic. Love, Lovecraft. I, I love I love his stories, but brilliant. his dialogue is fucking terrible. 
Oh, it, it, well, the style he was writing in was also very uh, antiquated, antiquated at that mm. time in which in which he was writing it, and yet it is so him. The fact that he can be mm. uh, imitated and made fun of and sort of satirized, the fact that his sure. is is an indication of how iconic he is. Uh, but there are a lot, he, you know. He created the genre, basically. Lovecraftian. Yeah. Love people it's describe that, people's work as Lovecraftian now. If it has tentacles yep. and you know dark elder gods. Yep. Oh yeah, no. His 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 imagination was, uh, you know, as uh, Stephen King said, he is the dark prince of the 20th century, without sure. a, a freaking doubt. And well, it looks I, I was like he say... might actually over he might over actually overtake Poe. It's starting to look that way. I feel I feel like when you're talking about if you're going to try and compare Lovecraft and Poe, to me that's comparing apples and oranges because mm. Poe's all of Poe's writing is just dripping with emotion, and it's it's all about a person's like struggle and a person's soul mm. being bared and and it's all of the melancholy. torment. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Like. It, he wrote almost nothing that could give you good feels. And even the stuff that gives you good feels, if you read it closely enough, you actually find out like, Oh, so this sounded all nice and sweet. And in reality, he was writing about like a corpse. You're like, Oh, that's not cool. It's thanks. like smashing like, pumpkins. If it was an author. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> and then, and then when you have Lovecraft, Lovecraft was about warping your sense of reality. It wasn't mm -hmm. so much emotionally charged as it was going into what it means to be mad. And how do you best Essential. exhibit that to somebody else? And so you're talking about one person who's focusing on mm -hmm. the horror aspects from an emotional depression kind of standpoint. And then someone else who's focusing on the horror aspects of I'm going to tear apart all of the rules and the, the comfort that you have for living in this world. And I'm going to just, none of that shit matters. You have no idea what's going to happen. No way to protect against it. Everything is is a different set of rules, and I'm never going to tell you exactly what those rules are. Yeah, so, so very you much don't, like reality. Don't have yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lovecraft is very modern. That that's yes. the way I would describe describe Lovecraft. Lovecraft is modern, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, Color Out of Space, the new one by with, uh, Richard, uh, with Nick Cage. Yeah, by Richard yeah, Stanley. Yeah. Brilliant, best Lovecraft movie ever. Nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it, it's it's brilliant, and uh, Nicholas Cage is at his very most Nicholas Cagey. <laughs> <laughs> I love Nicholas Cage when he's Nicholas Cage. As you Cagey. would want him. It's very tweaked. I very hate tweaked. When he, when he tries to not be Nicholas Cagey, that's when it all fails. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He has a, peach that's like Keanu hours. Reeves not being Keanu. Like, do, exactly. just, just do you, dude. It's better <laughs> when you do you. When you don't yeah. do you, it gets yep. weird. <laughs> yep. But Richard Stanley is a guy, you know, uh, his mother was the one who instilled in him a, a, his uh, love of lo of Lovecraft because Lovecraft was his mother's favorite uh, author. And, uh, phew, yeah, uh, it, 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 he actually really captures that sense of dread. And, of course, The Color Out of Space is one of Lovecraft's uh, best stories. But Lovecraft mm -hmm. is so classically difficult to adapt. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's, That's and, because the dialogue's terrible. Horrible. Oh, in, God, especially when he would do dialects. Oh, God. In a few words, what does it mean? Because I haven't read his stuff. What does it mean when someone says, this is Lovecraftian? That basically means there are dark elder gods that have been forgotten. There are elder societies and lots and lots of tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> there are these because I've actually had people mandatory. say that about they look on my campaign page and say wow this looks love Lovecraftian I'm like oh, okay I don't, I don't I, I hear that a lot about things I don't really know what it means there hentai. are sort of cosmic, dread. cosmic dread cosmic yeah. dread yeah. dread and hentai do the, I need to add in some tentacles I don't the know the biggest thing well, is all, yes. all of the all of the humans in the in the story there's usually one or two people they all learn that there is that the universe is so much bigger. And just so mm -hmm. insane, and that human beings are just the tiniest thing in it, and that there's no matter what happens, they really can't control anything because the universe is just so much bigger, and there's so much more going on than they than than in anybody's experience. All right, and, so there's, there's a little bit of that going on in my story, a little bit, not, not and quite the, same, but. the truth when you learn it will drive you mad. Yeah, yeah, 
It will drive you absolutely batshit crazy. It's so, is it that kind of uh, the guy from the Matrix who wants to go back in? He's like the I- ignorance is bliss. Uh, he oh wants to yeah, just kind of get oh, plugged yeah, back totally. in. Lovecraft's heroes very often end up at the end of their stories uh, insane. Yes. and Lovecraft's monsters. Oh, yeah. Lovecraft's monsters aren't the kind of monsters that you fight. They're more like the monsters that you run away from. And so you they're, they're insurmountable. Long, yeah. <laughs> Basically, and you, yeah. And you don't get very good looks at them. You get glimpses of them. Well, and, that's because Lovecraft knew that your imagination would make the monster much more fucking scary than wait, he could no, I love that. ever I love describe that. it. Wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, Michael, you do need some Lovecraft in your life. Definitely pick up, uh, uh, you know, the best of HP Lovecraft. Uh, there have been a, the De- the uh, Del uh, Del Rey ed- edition's really good. Uh, all, you know, uh, the uh, the HP Lovecraft Society actually put out an official audio book. Uh, give me just oh, a cool. second. Oh, cool. Um, I'm going to have a lot of drawing to do over the next couple of months, so that'll be something uh, good to have playing. Now, the iconic Audible, Audible has it, and it's fucking fantastic. Continue. The uh, yeah the uh, <laughs> thank you thank you thank you sir go on peasants <laughs> <laughs> paying uh, attention to you Luke uh, <laughs> not, not the, how uh, I meant it but yeah. it's it's all good it's all good uh, yeah I mean like you know the classic stories uh, the Dunwich Horror which is going to be Richard Stanley's yes. next Lovecraft movie uh, he's planning three uh, at the Mountains of Madness that's is he going at the Mountains. Because that's one of the, the kind of the biggest stories. I think. Oh yeah, that's a novel. Yeah. He wrote. I think, All right. Uh, uh, H.P. Lovecraft Society: The Complete Fiction of H.P. Lovecraft on Audible is the best version of H.P. Lovecraft stuff. All right, oh, I'm really? writing a note down right now. I've never written. I've actually never listened to to uh, Lovecraft in uh, audiobooks. So I mean, I, you know, I, I I discovered him when I was in high school. I think I was like fourteen, fifteen, or something like you that. You know, H.P. Lovecraft in audio is really difficult because of the way he wrote the English language, uh, yeah. it's a lot different than what, the way we speak it now. So oh, yeah. translating it to audio is an interesting proposition. These guys do a really good job. He uses the archaic words. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. And certain words. Thirty-five dollars. Yeah. Well, he, Lots of he polysyllables. Uses them, he uses them with the extreme, like the expressed intent to confuse you. Yeah. Because everything else will be sitting at like a standard level colloquial kind of speech, and then out of nowhere, these fucking words show up, and you're like, the every Eldritch. time I've ever read H.P. Lovecraft, I'll sit there reading reading it, and all of a sudden I'm like, motherfucker, where's my where's my phone? I start like going in like, all right, let me Google what the fuck this Eldritch Cyclopean <laughs> Cyclopean. Yeah, there's certain words he. That's one of the things that he gets teased. A lot of people will, will tease him about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once again, it's one of the things that makes Lovecraft Lovecraft. It's like you kind of wouldn't want to change that stuff. Oh, uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth. Mm, that, yeah, that's, that's a really a great one. one. Hey, Luke, I sent you a DM, by the way. Uh, where did you send me it? On Twitter? To Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know. I was one of those weird Word. kids that grew up reading uh, classics and uh, Dickens and all that sort of stuff. So I don't, I don't know. It, that seems to be a, a lot of archaic, or well, archaic for me anyway, uh, words in there that I yeah. still use to these days. But uh, yeah, well, yeah, people weren't even using those words back then. You know, that's if you read like the pulp fiction for, for, from that era, you know, he was contemporaries with uh, Robert E. Howard. And, uh, you know, who did uh, Conan the Barbarian and Cull and Solomon Kane and all those other kick-ass, toxically masculine characters. Mm. And they, had, they corresponded with each other, and they would actually borrow each other's gods. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there was a lot oh, of... Really? Of yeah. Stuff in oh, yeah. There was a lot of Cthulhu showing up in, in uh, you know, Conan. Oh, yes. hell yeah. Robert, yes. Robert E. Howard loved <laughs> Cthulhu. Yep. But it makes so much sense, because if you look at all of the, the creatures that Conan is going to go and fight... At some point, an eldritch god is going to be one of them. That would just, it just fits. Like, everything yep. and, and there are moments where Conan does go, oh, fuck this, and will turn tail and runs. It's like, I didn't fight this shit. Because Conan is smart. Yeah. Absolutely, he's smart. He's not educated, but he's but he's really smart, and he knows oh. when he when he's been whooped. He's like, okay, this is an unwinnable situation. I, I'm dude, I, trust I, his I'm like, peace out. Absolutely. He's not. Uh, what's that dude? Um, uh, that video game, uh, God of War. He's just like a dude who'll fight 
any uh, any creature, even if it's the size of a of a you know skyscraper. No. Have you ever played a God of War game? Yeah, I, pl- I played two. But, fucking uh, amazing. Are they good? Like, no, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was addicted to them. Amazing. I was addicted Which one would you to recommend? Them. Well, just start at the beginning. The first one. Through. If, if you're going to play anyone, any of them, uh, God of War, the first one, God start of War, at the beginning. it is just. Yeah, but, start at the beginning. Uh, it's, it's, it's a PS2 beat em up, but just the fun they have with the Greek pantheon is fucking great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and after you play the first too, one, that you're, the you'll progress through all of them because it's really hard to. To stop. Hey, first hits free, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Hey, as long as it's not like friggin' Dark Souls, man. I I pieced out of that game fast. I was like, I'm not spending Dude, fucking five hours. Man, to- I love Dark Souls. Like, I hate you know, it. I have a love. I can't do it. it. I can't. You do learn it. to bash your head against a brick wall until you <laughs> learn shit. You're that- like, eventually this will work. <laughs> I don't have that patience, man. I'm Dude, the concussion years tells me what to, to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you, Brian. I've had to, I've had to go cold turkey on video games because uh, yeah, I, I don't have time to do anything else anymore. It's just comics and YouTube and and family yeah. and that's it. I watch YouTube videos about video games now. I never get a chance to play. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Me I, too. Have, <laughs> I have a fucking gaming rig like three feet away from me. Do I ever get to play video games? Fuck no. Ain't nobody got time for that yeah. anymore. I'm too busy playing Skyrim for the 500 billionth time than oh, like to, to like actually like play anything new. Right? <laughs> it's like keep coming out with great mods, damn it. Whenever it comes to those kinds of games, I always get stuck like I was playing The Witcher, right? And and I don't I don't Which know one? how I managed. One, two, or three. I don't even remember anymore. It's been that long. I want to. I want to yeah. say three, but I don't remember. So we'll just pretend that uh, I didn't say it. But what I um, what I did notice is that somehow in playing The Witcher, which has a pretty decent like progression storyline, and mm-hmm. it's it's a little bit handholding, a little bit like you're gonna follow this path. I don't so know I don't how. Like yeah. I don't know how. I managed to find a way to grind on The Witcher. And I, I stopped my uh, story progression and I just ran around and I killed a bunch of people repeatedly over and over and over again in forests and I hunted a lot and I was like, this isn't what the game is. Like, there's so much more to it. But I was like, but I love Jerry. It's an open I just world wanted. game. That's what you do. <laughs> Shay, Shay, guess what? There is a mod on the, on the Nexus that makes Geralt look all hot like Henry Cavill. Yeah, no. Just so I, you know. I'm... So you know. So Henry I'm... Cavill <laughs> is like two or three months older than me, and <laughs> seeing how fit he is, it makes me wonder: <laughs> What am I doing with my life? Well, I hate... you're not doing eight hours a day in the gym, probably. Exactly. No, I'm not. I am drinking lots and lots of uh, dragon milk beer. Although and I know all the interviews I've seen from him, he seems like a pretty chill dude. Henry yeah, he, he, on the interview. He really do. He, he, he plays uh, World of Warcraft. He's a gamer. Dude, the He's reason a why nerd, just like the us. reason why yes. he, the reason why he plays The Witcher was because he was he loved he played the shit out of the video game. It was just like what they're making a That's Witcher cool. series. Oh, pff, hello, me, yo, ho, hello. Uh, I'm Henry Cavill. Hello. Yeah, and he's holding See? Big Blue down, so you got to give him props. I'm a I'm I'm a I'm a purist. Unfortunately, like every anytime somebody's like, "Oh, we got all these uh-huh. mods that do X, Y, and Z," I'm like, "No, screw that! If it was supposed to be in the game, it would have been in the fucking game." And so I just stay <laughs> purist with it, and it's it's but- so funny. I'm the same way with cosplay, and so like the the one that I just did today for God's hand, I sat after, and Anthony and I were talking, and I picked my cosplay apart. Cause I was like, I don't have the stitches in yet. And the, the hat isn't tall enough. And the, the little thing that I made in the front, it's not quite right, but it's really close. And he was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, it's great. Stop. And I'm just like, no, it's not, it's not perfect. You don't understand. I'm a purist. I want everything to be as it was. It was the same thing with Fraga Booms. I was like, my wig is purple, but her hair is more pink. And he Aww. was like, He's like, fucking seriously? Like, stop. You're the first person to ever do this. <laughs> yo, yo, yo. That stream was great. Welcome to the madness. Hey, what guys. up, Will? What's going on, homie? Hey, yo, man. 
No, I'm doing all right. How y'all doing? You're all talking Lovecraft. I'm, I missed that discussion. I'm very sad. Yeah, we're we're, to, we're talking. That's about, because uh, I am mildly well drunk and just a wee bit high. Again, <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> talking Lovecraft, drinking and wearing that suit. We've moved on from Lovecraft to Love, Harry Potter now. So. Lovecraft oh, was the tea Have we? Life, by the way, <laughs> have we really? never touched the stuff? Uh, well, but but, 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 like, but like with the mods, like, but like with the Skyrim mods, when I discovered that there was a Skyrim mod that let me play as Frank Frazetta's Death Dealer, pff, I was all over that. I love me some Frazetta. You know, everybody needs a little more Frazetta in their life, as far as I'm yes, concerned. Yes, yes, they do. Frazetta is amazing. I'm, I'm so psyched that um, Preston Acevedo is uh, going to be doing um, Six Gun Number Eight. He's going to be yeah. doing uh, the cover as a canvas. Oh, nice. And so he's, and he's like, so, like, 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 how do you want this cover? And I was just like, one word, what? Frazetta. <laughs> he's like, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> he's like, hey, no worries. That's a specialty of mine. <laughs> it is. It is. I know. I was so it's psyched. Metal, you can't that, drink dude. through that uh, mask, can you? Yes, there you can. There is literally a, a, a vision of about this big in this mask. I'm pretty sure it's centered around this eye right here. <laughs> and you can kind of see what's going on. Yeah, it's not so, good for your per peripheral vision, is it? What What is peripheral vision? What like, is breathing, too? Didn't you say that there's like a light in there or something? Is that supposed to make the eyes I, light up? You know what? I just bumped the mask into the microphone, and I literally cannot even see the screen right now. So I am... <laughs> I am 100% blind. <laughs> oh, God. This is what happens when you let Luke on stream. <laughs> I, no, well, no, it's no, when, I, when you I get him later in the day, not so much. <laughs> see, earlier, you know, he was coaching. find a way to modify this mask so I can actually see. Right here. Shay, That's where you're you the cat all are. Shay, you're the cat wrangler. Get this, <laughs> get this discussion back under control. Right, Jeff's okay. Arm. Plot holes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking um, of plot holes, yes, isn't that a new book by um, Sean Gordon Murphy? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> how's that for a name? Woo! I, I just don't know if I'd ever have holes in my in the name of my oh, story. That's just oh, it feels weird. Oh man, it feels so the prone, prone for for uh, That's a terrible name. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to say it. That's a terrible name. It's the first, first thing I thought, and everyone who's mentioned it since, that's the first thing they've said. Uh, no. Is that the name? Is that really the name of it? It's super smart, because then if they find, and they're finding plot holes in the in the book while they're reading, well, they can't say they were fooled, because it's right on the cover. Pre-advertised. I'm sorry. Are you are are we taking the uh, the cash grab approach to this, where you can't get mad if you don't get cash grab because he literally said the entire time that he was making right it there on the cover. We're going to get disclaimer. Cash grab. It's not a title. It's a disclaimer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just because I knew I was getting swindled doesn't mean I don't resent getting swindled. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No. Uh. I'm with you. I'm with. I'm with you there. I'm with you there, brother. Woo! All right. So, is there is there any other things that you guys can think of that you wanna you wanna kind of talk about when it comes to writing and plot holes specifically? Never Be write about your characters. Writing. What? Woo! All right. Be true Dave, to your characters and Always. their motivations. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No and, disagreement uh, from me there. And. <laughs> Always start with your ending. I mean, but but then again, that's just like that's what that's what works. For, that's what works for me. You know, Ray Bradbury always said, you know what, jump off the cliff, build your wings on the way down. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's an okay, that's a good approach to life in general, but not necessarily storytelling unless you're a freaking genius. <laughs> you know, <laughs> always have your always have your ending because you can always change that. I, I think that when it comes to me and what makes the most sense, at least in my brain and through my process when it comes to writing, is I need to know where my story is starting. I need to know where I'm hoping it's going to end up. And if there are any major points in between, uh, putting those down there and then just kind of going, okay, well, this is something that would make sense to happen here. This would make sense to happen here. Now, how am I going to do the in-betweens for those areas? Kind of like what Dave was saying. Yeah. And look at how can you 
if you get stuck on how to get from A to B, then go from B back to A and figure out how to step your way there. And, and make sure that with every scene that you're writing, you ask yourself, is this moving the story forward? And sometimes the answer to that will be no, and you can still keep the scene if it's like a character scene. Right. You know? And uh, always think about uh, keep uh, mood and uh, pace in mind, too. Yeah. And that, that's actually something else that I was going to say when it comes to... So the the book that I'm working on, and when I say book, it's going to be a graphic novel because it makes sense to tell it with pictures. But the the book that I'm looking at, while it's in a series, each of the stories that I want to do are complete standalone. And it's because they're each going to cover a specific facet of mental illness through the, the eyes of somebody that maybe you wouldn't expect to suffer from that particular one. Um, and the, the big thing for me is it doesn't have to, like the story doesn't have to seem like it's moving forward super, super well or necessarily progressing so long as it's setting the right tone. Because the whole point of everything that I'm writing is an emotional response. It's supposed to help evoke an emotional response from the reader, which means that there's going to be a lot of scenes where it seems like the girls are just maybe walking down a, a busy, you know, city street or something like that. But there's going to be small cues along the way that are supposed to help the reader along with what's actually happening as opposed to what dialogue might say. Um, and as stuff continues to, to progress, dialogue will be less and less and the, the pictures will be taking more and more precedence because it, it's sometimes it's easier to show than it is to necessarily tell. Well, that's what, that, that's, well, that's another uh, important rule. Show, don't tell. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, God, man, when, when, when I did my first issue of six gun, for instance, I wanted to make sure that I was doing a comic that where if you didn't speak English or uh, or if you couldn't even read, you could still understand the story just by looking at the pictures. Because we're very much living in this age of uh, the Brian Michael Bendis talking heads approach. You mean yeah. like a, a visual medium that requires pictures to actually tell a story? Like comic books? I don't know what that is. Oh just talking my heads. God! Yeah, if yeah, I, I mean, have to watch one more group of superheroes have a fucking conversation in the diner, I might just grab a Tommy gun and kill some people. It's so it's it's. You terrible. might be talking about something very very uh, important for society, though. You, you, you never know what comes out. These comics that are coming out now, <laughs> nobody <laughs> is ever gonna read that shit. Except to laugh at it, mock at it, and be like, you know, for historical purposes, like there no, was once nobody's this gonna read that shit unless they've been picking up Avengers for fucking thirty years and they continue to pick up Avengers because they have every single one from nineteen seventy fucking three. Like, yeah, stop they, they, pumping they, this they, shit they, into fucking comics. They might pick it up, but they're not reading it. They're just filing it away and being like, "I'm waiting until it's okay again because it, yep. it's turned to shit." But damn it, I'm getting every issue, so it's just I have like, every one from fucking 1973. I'm going to continue. Yes, very much mm -hmm. so. You could tell a more of a story with a facial expression than you can from a huge word balloon taking up half the panel. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where your artist comes in. This is where your artist comes in. <clears throat> and, I, I, you know, I am very, very evangelical about this. Trust your artist. Mm -hmm. You know, embrace the collaborative nature of the medium. Don't be a dick. Don't uh, be territorial. If you're you if hired you're, them for a reason, right? Exactly. Yeah. And if also they have an idea that's your better than yours, go with it. Because it's not also, about your you pay attention to your letterer because I like oh, I've yeah. I've been you know hired to do one or two pages of lettering, and I had to turn back to the the individual who hired me and I was like, dude, you want me to put about six different little dialogue, but like not actual dialogue, but like the story square dialogue bubbles. Yeah, in a panel Narration. That is, yeah, it's basically um, in a panel that is a fifth of the page and only half half across. And you want me to put how many in there because you wanted to describe like the details of the ship. And I went, you know what would make sense? It would be an entire splash page of the ship. Yes. Where we can put down some of that stuff and you get to see how fucking cool the ship is. And he went, 
oh damn that's a good idea i was like i'm telling you right now i'm not going to be able to do what you want otherwise so it's no, either no, that no, or not that logical, well you actually you actually brought up a, an interesting point about how dialogue can you know translate into scenes i remember there was something in um when they were trying to fix blade runner when when they were made the film and they had holes and they were trying to fix it with the famous voiceover mm -hmm. and Harrison Ford was in there and he's reading all this dialogue, you know, and he's going, you know, I'm playing a character and, and it was a detective who does no detecting. He's doing it all through the voiceover. Why don't we take the voiceover and make them scenes like of him actually doing the detecting as opposed to right. saying he's doing the detecting. And that well, goes into what you just said, which was instead of talking about the ship, why don't we have a cool section where we show the ship? Well, exactly. Yeah, you know. but, yeah, but here's the thing about the voiceover, because I know most people don't like it, but uh, I, I think I think a lot of people miss this. It was to help give it a Raymond Chandler esque feel. Right. This is prior whole... to the movie when they, when it was way oh. more relying on the voiceover. Like there was a, wow. a like they were trying to condense the movie with the voiceover. Gotcha. And it, they ended up making Decker not a detective because he had so much voiceover, and they, he was detecting right. in the voiceover, right. not right. in the movie. And that right, was Harrison right, right. Ford's right. big problem. It's like, why don't we make me a detective? Right, right, <laughs> so right, can, right, right. Like, I'm a detective, but I'm doing no detecting. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. Show him being a te detective rather than telling me that he's a detective. Right, right. and that goes back to what and Shane was saying. And never detect. Instead <laughs> yeah, of talking about the ship, say, let's I'm an awesome detective. see the shit. Right. Whereas, you know, the the uh, the amount of voiceover that ended up in that movie is, I think, really just enough. It's enough to uh, help give it that, you know, that melancholy, bluesy kind of like Raymond Chandler uh, esque oh, feel. Yeah. I know. Just I never liked it. Noir. It's yeah. some yeah. movies you need the voiceover. It's an integral part of the movie. That one, it always felt a little shoved on to me. So I know a lot of people don't like it. What? What? Uh, what? part are we talking about are we talking about the ending uh where they they read the, 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 the ending opening. part or are we talking are we keeping the tears in the rain ending because that's the only one that i will recognize uh, sushi i don't why, think why, why yeah, i think you, that's where the cold fish that's where the voiceover really like crashes into the movie is the tears and rain like right after that beautiful speech it just like right when you're sort of with him and he's dying that's and his soul's going up to heaven and then it's like just charges right. Hey, you know, I guess he figured out that you know, life was precious, and we're like, okay, dude. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we, we understood so, that. Thank you. So yeah, I watched the I watched the one before they did that bullshit, right? Because that was the that was the add in. Um, it like well, the, the movie was supposed to end with that whole tears in the rain and everything was beautiful and and wonderful yeah. and really poignant, and you got to you got to just kind of sit in the afterglow of that moment because that moment was so impactful and so just um, really emotional, really, really well done. And then Brilliant. when they, they went back later and they redid voiceover because they felt that it wasn't happy enough and they murdered everything about that show. And it, it took it, like, I remember when when i was finally shown that ending and i watched it and i had the biggest disgust look on my face all the time i was like i will never recognize this as anything to do with blade runner my ever, my favorite ever. version of blade runner my because of course you know i got the I, you know it's one of those movies i own in every format except laser disc no actually i have a laser laser disc yeah, you know, i don't have a laser disc, laser disc. yeah no i don't have the criterion laser disc but uh you know the best version of uh, my, my favorite version is the European version. Uh, that's the same version that was released on home video. What? Which one is that one? Which ending is that? That's uh, with the ending that uh, ha uses uh, footage from The Shining. Okay. We're, oh, we're you know we're going off, and she's yeah. gonna live forever, and we're gonna live happy ever after. Yeah. Yes. Screw all that stuff yes. we said about life. Yes. Who cares? Yes. Yes, that's what. Yeah, yeah, that's my. That's my. That's actually my my, my favorite. Uh, my favorite uh, edit of that of that movie. And I really? know that's a contra. Yeah, and I know that that's a controversial opinion. It also has. Uh, it's also <laughs> gorier. It's also a lot gorier. What makes it uh, more gory? I don't because uh, I've you, seen it so many times see, in so many different versions. You see, it uh, together. You, there's extra footage. There's extra footage of of uh, of. Um, Zora getting uh, holes blown in her, and oh, okay. uh, there's a longer shot of the nail going through Roy Batty's hand, <laughs> and there's a longer <laughs> shot of uh, of um, uh, Deckard uh, resetting his broken fingers. 
Yeah, okay. So that because there's a big old chunk that comes out of Zora when he shoots her in the back. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. You know? And and Ridley Scott is a lying sack of shit when he says that Deckard is a replicant. That's some like George Lucas, like, oh, I meant this all along, shit. Because everybody that worked on that, rally. everybody who worked, yeah, thank you. Everybody who worked on that was just like, uh, yeah, no. It's just like I, mean, I, later I, I never he thought, thought that was a big deal that he is or not. Who cares? You know. Well, I, I, well, well, yeah, it, it's just like Harrison Ford was just like, nobody told me I was playing a replicant. He was just like, yeah, that's bullshit. Uh, so I think that's something where Ridley Scott was like, you know what? I should have made him a replicant. And then was like, was like, and you can see in the interviews with him too. Like, he, like, I mean, like, you know how liars, they have like, how they have tells, you know, <laughs> they do certain things with their eyes and he's doing that thing. I'm just like, oh, you lying mf -er. I, I actually think the movie is a little scarier when, if he's a replicant, there's that, that really nasty, not nasty, but scary line when Rachel says to him, like when she's yeah. kind of coming to grips that she's not who she is. That's the possibility. And it's then she goes, have you ever, she says, have you ever done that test on yourself? And it, and it fills you with such existential dread because if you ever think that, am I just making it in a Kantian sense? Am I just making this up? Am I really alive? Am I really, am I really experiencing? Am I just an illusion? Right. And right. that's a creepy thing to, to contemplate for a second. It is. It is. Uh, for a second. Love it. Right. But, uh, Are any of us alive? What? What was that, Luke? Are any of us alive? We, I mean, yeah, like I said, it's, it's a very... Kantian thing, right? It's like, mm -hmm. what That's is the awful. thing in and of itself, you know? And that yeah. that line always freaks me out. Which is, have you ever done that to yourself? Because if would you even do it if you had a doubt? Would you just want right. to live? You want to know? Thinking you're a the person. Problem with that with that thread is you keep unraveling it, and then it just takes away all the stakes and motivations, and exactly you can get into a big uh, quagmire, a big mess of nothingness. Exactly. Like, uh, there has to be something it, real. Still, like, what is human life? You know, uh, we we have all this technology, but what is human life once we have all this technology? That's uh, cyberpunk distilled down to its very core. Yeah. High tech, and, low life, and for, and and also the robot story uh, mm -hmm. and science fiction. And especially yeah, I was just thinking of data exactly when you said that. I was thinking of that episode of uh, Next Generation where they have put mm. uh, data on trial of whether yes. or not he's alive. Yeah, and whether or not he's, thinking he's a machine. But then you start listening to the arguments, and you're like, well, hang on here. Right, uh, exa exactly, this is, and this is that a lot is, different to what I thought it would be. That's 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 the robot story in a nutshell. It's all about the soul, and whether we have one or not, and what does it mean to have a soul? Uh, especially well, for Phil K. Dick, he was obsessed with this. Uh, yes, with, uh, with Phil God. K. Dick so and William Gibson. Idea, yep, that whole idea about do we have a soul or not? That's what made that final scene. Yeah, of of the you know. <laughs> Like the tears falling, like it's like tears and in the bird, thing, and you're no, just like the dove, yeah. Holy <laughs> shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is... Roy Batty had a soul, of course, of it, course. He it's... Did. I, 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 philosophically and, and logically, I think he does. You know, just, Absolutely. Yeah. So. Well, and it, it, the thing is, is the the way that so they're sitting here trying to make it out like he's just some cold, calculated machine, and that's all he is. But if you actually look at it and you look down to the to the core, it's like this look at everything that he went through to survive it, it was wasn't like, yeah. there was any other motivation than to not be eliminated that was all that it was is i want to survive and i want to be i want alive. more oh. life Fuck yes her. and yeah, then I and when he's sitting there and he says that line and i was like that is one of the most profound lines i have ever heard in any movie ever and it is it is coming from something that is supposed to not be human and that just it's a great blew, like, sample in Fear up. Factory as well. Yeah, it, it is. Love me some Fear Factory. Love me some Fear Factory. Who are, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Burton C. Bell very obviously uh, obsessed with uh, with that movie. Dry Lung with, Martyr. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, Blade Runner was one of those movies when it first came out. I remember seeing it and thinking, instant classic, instant mm. classic. And it was a bomb at the box office, <laughs> and it was lambasted by critics. That's usually I, it, so. This is how I now judge what a good movie is, right? If if the critics just railroad it and 
say it's absolutely terrible. It's probably <laughs> phenomenal. It is probably one of the best probably. movies we've ever existed. And you I will should go probably watch. watch it. The yeah. other I can, movie, I can actually see why it, it bombed. It, it just it took a long time to digest. It was just <laughs> there's just so much in there, and on my face, really, at that time, I'm, it's a movie yeah. that makes you fucking think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My you want viewing. to think when they go to the cinema. But guys, yeah. it was among two classics that came out that year. That I was about to say came out as well that summer. And that bombed hardcore. Wait, too. Okay, what was the other one? John thing? Carpenter's John remake Carpenter. is the thing. No, the thing. Uh, uh, that's because people are fucking stupid. That movie's fucking amazing. <laughs> and ET yeah, was the one that dominated. You're not going to survive with ET in those two films. Nobody's going to go see those two movies when ET is out there. Sorry. I will never forgive. I will never forgive my uh, cousin from Germany because he was visiting, and my father took us to the movies, and we, you know, we had a choice of uh, what we wanted to see, and he wanted to see Tron, so we went to see Tron. The Nobody other movie, the, the other movie was the fucking thing. Fuck you, oh. Mark. <laughs> Wait, which one did you guys see? Tron. Oh, okay. I, I, I've never seen the thing. You've never seen the thing. I've always it's seen nothing. Never I've always hold, up, hold, up, hold, up. hold up. You've oh. never seen John Carpenter's The Thing. Now let me let me Rent let for me a treat. It. It's not for oh, oh, my God. God. It's just for whatever, like, I was really young when it came out, so my dad didn't take me to see it. It came out before it was Like, born. years later, and now it's like, whenever I want to see it, I can't find it anywhere. I try to, like, even pirate it online, I can never find it. Death Metal, so, my like, friend. Remember, I'll remember, find it for you. Death Metal, hmm? rem yeah, yeah. remember, when, when, you, when, when you meet unfortunate souls... Like uh, like Indy Dave over here who haven't seen John Carpenter's The Thing, the thing to do is to not to scold them. It's to be like, ah, oh, you, you are in, you, you yeah, are, you're in, for, in for a treat. Yeah, yes, it's, you it, are. it's not something I haven't wanted to see. It's just for whatever reason, whenever it's like thought of the movie, I'm like, oh, I really want to watch that. I don't know where to find it to, to watch hey, it. Hey, hey, I never read any Lovecraft. The special effects <laughs> alone. You're yeah, in like, right for a treat too, man. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've seen like, the special effects alone are just amazing. Rob Botin, man. Holy oh, yeah. okay. my god. Okay. Hold on a second. Dave. Dave. Yeah. Do you have Amazon Prime? Is it on Amazon Prime? Should be. I just posted the link in the chat. <laughs> yes, right. it is. Hell yeah. I would say this. I I just, you shit. just got that. So maybe uh, when I give a chance, I'll check it out. Now. Oh, Andy, Dave, I mean, in terms of just without talking about the story, just the sheer quality of the production. From cinematography oh, yeah. to music to production design to acting to Scrap to you know to to staging to lensing, it's just a Sam supreme and shop. Film, period. Yeah, like, okay. I've seen I've seen bits I've seen different scenes of the movie, but I've never seen it like from beginning to end. I, I mean, that blood brilliant. test scene, guys. The blood test Watch scene. It. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. Br it, it's br it's brilliant. Yeah, that's another oh, one. I forgot about that. <laughs> that's another that's one. The movie, right there. Like, like, is that yeah, Blade Runner. A great scene. I've seen it. I've I've seen it uh, twice, and it was a while back. Like I haven't I haven't seen it recently, and okay. so I'm like, yeah. So I just went and and when I looked it up and everything, and I was like, oh, that's right. Kurt Russell was in it, and he was so <laughs> he perfect. In it. He's, He's the most perfect back. I'm done. I'm trying to do my McCready right now. Well, the hey, thing I'm worried about McCready. <laughs> the thing that's great about McCready as a hero is that he's totally cynical. He's an incredibly cynical mf -er, but he's McCready also... McCready is just trying to survive. And he doesn't break out until much later in the film. That's what's kind of cool about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and... Cassidy, it's fucked. Yeah. It's it 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 so straight bad. fucked sideways in that movie. Who? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing that's and the thing the thing about McCready is that as, as much as he's a cynical mf'er, he's ultimately self sacrificing. And Keith and, Davidson, who's another favorite actor, my oh Keith Davidson, voodoo man. bullshit. <laughs> and what, what were we talking about this voodoo bullshit? <laughs> oh, fantastic! It's such a it's yeah that and Blade Runner when it came out, like I remember thinking. I mean, they got like, both got shot down, man, that summer. Yeah, and I remember thinking. These are instant classics. 20 years from now, they're going to get recognized as classics. And I was wrong. It took about 15. <laughs> I was off by five years. Yeah, I mean, I John Carpenter, the guy who was good. way ahead of his time in most of the movies he made. Oh, you know, God. Like, they Live. I mean, Jesus Christ. They Live. Uh, a big I'm going to kick China. ass and chew bubblegum. And I'm all out of gum. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even Vampires is great. I love Vampires. I love Vampires, too. Yeah. I saw That's that one very maligned and misunderstood movie. Oh, I was watching that the other day. I was watching um, 
the line where he's talking to the priest and he's like, and uh, James Wood says, one of these guys will bend you over. <laughs> yep. They're not walking around with cheesy Euro trash accents. Yep. I love says, James Woods. He's oh, you know fucking what? hilarious. I know you're yeah, not supposed to. I even like Ghost of Mars. I think Ghost of Mars is great. Oh, there I just I got I got to part with I got to part with you there, man. brother. I, I love I love Mind you, I haven't seen it like since it came out. So I love everything JC does. I'm a big JC. Oh, fan. You, I was really fucking high when I saw that movie. Oh so yeah, I mean, probably better than it was. Um. Yeah, like everything from Assault on Precinct 13 all the way there. I'm, I'm oh, saying. God, Huge. yeah. Assault on Precinct 13, man, when I was a kid, it was one of the first movies that, that I uh, videotaped, with, uh, recorded with my VCR. Uh -huh. I watched that at least 100 times that summer. With that, that cool thing? I, I, I did that with the first Mortal Kombat movie. Classic. Classic, man. John Carpenter is a shitty dude as a musician, dude. His stuff I is... Know. And he actually goes on tour with his uh, his movie soundtracks. Yeah, we all know it's from New York. Movies. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, six a.m. in the house. Six a.m. is one of my favorite guys on Twitter right now. Me too. Me too. Me too. His book looks amazing. Can, can we get on his ass? Can we get on his ass to like right. bust a move and, and and like get the star fetched campaign? Like he is working on it. Stop I know. It I know. I'll, I'll stop. So funny though. I'm goes, stopping. Oh, Mark knows I'm a fan. He goes, I was hoping somebody would be streaming because uh, I wanted to listen to something while I worked. And I was like, dude, you've been on for two and a half hours. We're about to stop. And he goes, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do have to boogie. I, uh, I, I, have to I got I got I got I got I got a bit do an Elvis and check on my mama. And it is, and it is, and it is, mom, it is, it is mama, it is mama's day. So uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I I think that two and a half hours is a very good stream, and we <laughs> mostly yeah. more or less stayed on topic. I gotta come um, in before you all get high and drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Shay, uh, how are you? Shay, you did a fine, admirable job with an incorrigible bunch of dudes. Right. So, so I'm too uh, straight edge for this stage in the discussion. <laughs> before, we, uh, before we all kick off, I want to make sure that you guys get a chance to kind of talk about the projects you're working on that you are writing. So we'll do a quick around the room so everybody can kind of talk about what they've got and make sure we go and uh, back them on Indiegogo if they're live or just uh, bug the fuck out of us so we, we keep working on our stuff and don't put it on the back burner because <laughs> that's, that's this situation right here. Uh, so go Don't ahead. Don't worry, we'll help you out. In Indie Dave, I'm going to kick it over to you first. All right, I'm the writer of Oddity, which is now an Indiegogo for only $15. And it's a oh, action yeah. horror comedy, not necessarily in that order, about a mutant frog guy who uh, unleashes monsters on his community and now has to figure out how to uh, fix it. Look, So looking oh, yeah. forward to it. There you are. I mean, uh, honestly, if you haven't backed Oddity, uh, you're an asshole, and I need you to go do that right now because <laughs> look, straight up, uh, calling your ass out. Get down on absolutely it. Absolutely, I am. Ask it. Dave. Ask Dave how much I've been like. When's it coming out? So when's it coming out? So when's it coming out? It got to the point where he was like, "Hey, uh, we're that's gonna make you the flatter, so now you'll know because it'll depend on how many fucking pages you've actually done." And I'm like, "Oh, yeah, okay, never mind. I'll stop asking." I saw, it's a movie. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, and no. you need to go outside. Oh, oh there it is. Hold on, hold on. Big oh. happy. Big Peppy. Oh, those big no, eyes. Oh, 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 okay. Hail the Nirvana shirt. Hail the fucking Nirvana shirt. <laughs> I'm wearing the flannel to go with it, even. I like it. <laughs> All right, Brian. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, right now, uh, Six Gun Gorilla. Oh, so we're doing dog porn. Let <laughs> <laughs> six gun gorilla, long days of vengeance. You know you Big want it. You know you want it. You know you want it. It is uh, currently uh, in demand. 
It's a nice, big, thick, 148-page uh, trade paperback. Uh, you can get it with a brand spanking new uh, cover, a variant cover by Kanan White. Uh, you can also get it with yes, a... With the, isn't he amazing? Love that He's dude. fucking incredible. Yeah, he oh is. Oh, my God, that dude. Yeah. So you can get it with an all-new, super bitchin' wicked cool cover, a variant cover by Kanan White. Uh, there's also the latest issue, number seven, The Big Gun Down. That's... Like twenty, that's twenty four pages. If you buy them together, I like I knock five bucks off the price. Uh, everybody, I you know I don't I don't say this to boast. I, I say this like with the utmost gratitude and humility. People, everybody who reads it loves it. So uh, go check that out. Also, if I could pip real quick, uh, my man Drew's book, <laughs> Captain <laughs> Love, Captain Love, Love. the current campaign, Mister Macability. Uh, yes, you're gonna want to uh, pick the uh, pick this up, but you're also you're gonna want to back his new campaign. He's like two hundred and fifty dollars from the ten k club. He's somebody that's done a lot for the comics gate community, and I'm not saying like you know it's, it's a charity thing. His book is genuinely very well written, beautifully Some illustrated. Pages. Yeah, and He's a yeah, cool dude. I was just on a stream the other day with him. He's lots of fun. Fantastic. Fantastic. And also my man, Preston Acevedo, who I'm working on a top, uh, right now, writing a top secret project with him uh, and having a lot of fun. Uh, a little a little hint, I'm breaking into uh, my old uh, copies of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Enoch. So there's going to be uh, Ooh, Demons is Lurking and Evil's at Work. Enoch. Yeah, uh, and awesome. uh, he's he's got Doc Salem, and he also deserves way beyond deserves to be in the 10K club. So go check those out, please. Absolutely, Doc Salem's badass. I I did a, a female Doc Salem cosplay. It was one of my he favorite did. ones that I did. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and patches for uh, Rock and, and patches. Hell you. yeah! All right, on to Michael, who is going to be on Red Valkyrie in the near future. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I, could you share my screen? I just pulled up my campaign if you can. Oh, cool. okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Since you <laughs> insist. Since you insist. Yeah, this is my campaign. This is my book. This is uh, I'm the writer. I'm the artist, the colorist, the letterer, the everything, the promoter. Wow. I uh, never sleep. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's Look called The Lucian. <laughs> Cover there. An yeah, author. If you you know if you're into uh, a little bit of action like the Matrix kind of stuff, if you like stories that uh, incorporate uh, kind of a reimagined history like Highlander or Assassin's Creed, uh, this might be the book for you. Uh, it's uh, it's mostly completed. I'm uh, you know kind of still finish finishing it off, but uh, yeah, it's a 56 page story. Uh, the book itself though is 76 pages because it's going to have some uh, bonus material in there. Including things there. like uh, little uh, character interviews, so uh, that's uh, I think they're pretty interesting. And um, absolutely, yeah, that's the book there. And uh, we're I'm actually I'm only like a couple of backers away from unlocking. Uh, if I just scroll down, where is it here? Yeah, I'm doing a full color print. So this is obviously still a work in progress. Still haven't done the colors yet. I have Ooh. to finish a bit of the line art. But yeah, we've got guys in there with fun powers, like this guy's manipulating water and. Um, yeah, lots of uh, lots of cool stuff coming on. It's a, it's an ongoing series, so yeah, it's uh, you get in on this first one and uh, get a get to see a bit of the uh, the universe that I've created here, and uh, I think you really like it if you if you back it. Yeah, so thanks for uh, letting me spruik that Shay. That was awesome. You Absolutely, just got... and I I will say uh, your book is one that I I saw it. I went and clicked on it from a tweet from Tompa because everybody knows Tompa is the king of uh, promotional yep. tweets. Hal Tompa. And uh, I'm pretty sure that I saw it and went, yep, and backed it the same day. Um, oh, partially thank you so because much. I, like, you got you got a, a lead who's like a strong, badass female redhead. So, I mean. Well, yeah, it's going to be very interesting for you to see that. Test. Yes, she absolutely does have red hair. Uh, she looks yes. like a badass on this cover, but uh, there's a bit more than meets the eye here. Like I say in my, my tagline, nothing is as it seems. So uh, uh, you're not getting a Mary Sue with her. She's also just a normal girl who thinks she's kind of living a normal life. Uh, she's about to be thrown into this crazy world, and uh, she's not going to land on her feet straight away. So we're going to be like that's sort of a fun part of the story. You're going to see her uh, progression um, and uh, whether or not she's going to be able to deal with this crazy world that she gets thrown into. Backer 181. 
Yeah, and thank I, you, Brian. And, I'm you, your book is on my list too, my friend. Uh, uh, I've just yeah, got, don't got feel so alive. many on the list. I know. <laughs> I love all this cross promotion stuff that happens. And, and Shay, Shay, when you have him on, that's going to be a real tough cosplay. Uh, it's going to be so hard. I don't know Brutal. how I'm going to do it. Brutal. Yeah, I literally, like, I saw it and I went into my closet and went bam, bam, bam. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I, was like, oh. I just, apparently, I am this chick. I'm okay with that. <laughs> It, it, oh, it looks right. like a beautiful book. Looks like a beautiful book. That's I, why I I'm it. super excited for it. Thank All you, right, bro. Luke, you're up, sir. You crazy, demented bunny. Too scary. <laughs> if you are wondering why I look like a death bunny right now, that's because of Black Flag Pineapple Perception. Back it on Indiegogo. <laughs> we are well over 100K right at this moment. Hell yeah. We want you. <laughs> To back, back flag. <laughs> Get your perception right. And Dan, oh my god! And 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 I told Dan, I told I told that fool that he was gonna be rocking that bunny suit a lot sooner than he was expecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that he had to wear the pink bunny suit. I was like, so when am I getting you back on Red Valkyrie? Now that you're in the pink suit. At 6 a.m. <laughs> 6 a.m. Yes. Comics, man, we're waiting for you to uh to come at him with the flow. To uh, seriously, you know, we need children or bunny suit. <laughs> All right, and Will. Well, I'm I'm too stupid to share my screen. I don't know what I'm doing, so I'll just talk about it. Because <laughs> you might see my I don't know, you might see my furry you know forums or something. That I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm so, so are you high? So no, yeah. like I told you, I'm too straight edge for this. Uh, but that's Luke all right i'm high say, enough for both of us as luke just said <laughs> we are i am uh the co-writer of black flag pineapple perception which yeah. we are crushing on indigo right now thank you guys whoever um backed it thank you so much i am also the guardian and uh scribe of the continuing icu universe which i'm working on right now for the other all day. hail the bible keeper I am the Bible keeper. <laughs> I am putting together the uh, the um, Pentateuch. Nice. I Hell am yeah. Alexandria. Hell the dream yeah. maker. Don't get burned down, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying the same thing. I hope you've got like uh, you know like asbestos, asbestos carpeting and uh, lots of fire extinguishers <laughs> hanging out. Redundancies. Yes. Uh, last little parting <laughs> shot from Spurg. So many gingers in Comic Gate, they're pretty much cast off from the rest of society, and we're the only ones that will take them. Oh, oh so true. true. Even, you know even what? the we are the new comics industry. Do you yeah. actually have blue yeah. in your beard, Luke, or is that like some like weird green screen splash? What? No, this? He's got blue. Okay, no, you actually have. Okay, I I did that. Yeah. Okay. Listen, if that's the worst thing I do to myself in quarantine, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> no? I mean... All right. Well, I the next time I gotta say... come by earlier so we can get I can get into yeah, the heat of this so, so to let everybody know, 10 p.m. Eastern every Sunday night, we are okay. now doing writing pros. We are going to continue to change up the topics every night and we will more or less kind of stay on topic. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But the, the big point of doing this is to give everybody a chance to kind of come together. I mean, artists can do art threads and things like that because it's sexy and it's pretty and people like looking at it. There's never a writer thread where we stream us writing because it's boring as fuck to watch. <laughs> so instead, we decided we were going to do something like this. We were going to sit and talk about various aspects of writing, uh, get some insight, have some debate, get some, some interesting perspectives from people who are writing uh, in various stages. So I'm, I'm the resident noob. Uh, we got people that are writing their first campaigns, people that are writing their fifth campaign. Um, when Sty gets back, we will have a, a writer who's written on a bunch of other forums but hasn't done anything for Comics Gate, and we're we're just kind of all coming together to all share our perspectives. So, any idea what the if next you enjoy this, 
Um, to be determined, but I will, I, I would add you, but you refuse to have a Twitter. So, uh, <laughs> get with the program, Will. Jesus. I'm man. on Telegram. I'm, I'm with all the other degenerates. <laughs> just yeah, just send me an SOS. I'll get it. Make a Source Twitter title. just so I can add you to this chat group. Okay. So can help I'll, just, I'll, just call, like, I'll just call, like, you know, Rhea. <laughs> <laughs> it is, look, t Twitter is is a toxic cesspool, but it's yeah, you need it. You just for, gotta uh, know what okay. what puddles to not step in. I love just the toxic cesspool the of uh, That's all. Telegram. Now, Twitter Twitter is funny if you've got a nihilistic sense of humor like I do. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I thought they like banned you for being nihilistic. Now, what about it? It, 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 it makes life smoother. Let me tell you. All right. Well, Any before day. before we get on another tangent, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and say, please like, share, and subscribe to Red Valkyrie. If you enjoy writing prose, please share this out because not only is it entertaining, not only are we having fun, but this this is genuinely useful shit. Every time I do one of these shows, I feel like I learn so much and I get much more motivated to go and write my own stuff. Because being around people that are creative and that have such great perspectives is really inspiring. And so if it's inspiring for somebody like me, it's probably going to be inspiring for a lot of other people who are on the fence or don't consider themselves writers for whatever reason. So let's share this shit out and so people can kind of get past those hurdles and start doing uh, really epic shit for, for CG and for indie comics as a whole. And I'm a um, moron. I'm working on... Black flag. So, <laughs> well, that's what I was about to say. It's like, look at us. We're morons. Yeah, so. <laughs> Will, okay, you ain't supposed to do this. Will, you ain't supposed to, supposed to tell people that until it after the, the campaign closes. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to wait on that, dude. Yeah. But whatever. <laughs> hey, that's what all CG good. is all about, man. That's what CG is all about. We got so many people that have been on the sidelines doing shows. Hosting other uh, indie creators, helping them pimp their books, helping them get 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 their message out there, and now they're looking at us and they're going, "Hmm, gee, those books don't seem too smart, and they're actually pulling this <laughs> off. Why don't I give it a try?" <laughs> you know, I'm I'm to, yeah, I'm to, if I can do it, oh, anyone can. I've got at least here, a so. dozen tabs saved for Indiegogo campaigns for CG books just because they look so fucking good. I know. Like, there are mm -hmm. so many good books coming out. I know. Like, yeah, I know. In my pockets. Yeah. Like they are. yeah. This is I where the small tier. Are. I want to go up to the high tiers and, you know, <laughs> this, yeah, is the the this is where I the used to work are. in a nine to five shop. I used to work Fridays and Saturdays in a, in a comic shop and this shit is more interesting. It's more eye-catching than the stuff I would put out on the wall. That's because like, they're passion projects, man. Every project here is a passion project. Yes. Absolutely. So make sure that you go and check out a lot of CG projects. Make sure that you're checking out Red Valkyrie. If you don't know, if you want to back something, because we in-depth in a lot of these projects. And if you want to learn how to write and you want to have uh, questions answered, make sure you check out Writing Pros every Sunday at 10 p.m. And we will catch you guys next time. Thank you so much. CG for life.